Good evening. Uh, welcome to my colleagues and to the superintendent who are here this evening. We also have our chairperson, Dina Hayes Green, and board member Kim Irby with us on the phone. Um, Chairwoman Hayes could not be here this evening due to some family obligations. We appreciate your being here by phone. So I'm in the hot seat and I ask in advance for your patience and forgiveness. We'll take any corrections or redirections from my colleagues. Um, and we'll rely on our attorney, Jill Wilson, and our clerk, Lisa Nolan, to keep the train on the tracks tonight. Um, we've got a lot on the agenda and a lot of guests. So, um, Board Member Sharp, would you lead us in the pledge in a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you will, a moment of silence, Thank you. Thank you. We are now at the moment in the meeting for public comments and um, we do have a, a long list, I think 36 members of the public who are here this evening, and I'm going to say a little bit about what that process is. I do want to note that other public bodies in our community, the county commissioners and the city councils, limit the time period for public comments, not just for individual speakers, but they often limit the speaking period to 30 minutes here at the Board of Ed. We don't do that. We allow all the speakers who have registered to speak. Um, and so that will be a little bit of a time here this evening, and um, we welcome all those who've made the time to come express their views. So folks do um, register to speak by calling 336-370-8100, or they email our clerk, boardclerk at gsnc.com, and they do that by 12 p.m. on the day before the meeting. So a maximum of three minutes is granted to each speaker. And um, we have typically designated 30 minutes, but we will allow each speaker to speak this evening. Speakers will be admitted into the meeting room in order in which their request was received by our board clerk. Um, we do screen speakers prior to entering the building. Face coverings are required as per the Guilford County mandate. And uh, they can be removed briefly during public speaking. Um, written comments may also be submitted to our board by sending an email to boardclerk at gcsnc.com. And that can be done by noon um, the day before the meeting with the subject line, public comments. Um, and then comments received by email are posted with the meeting agenda. So you may see some additional comments online. Um, so with that, let's see. Um, we also ask that you state your name and address for the record. Uh, Kim Hip on our staff is here with the clock. You get a, a, what is it, an orange light or a yellow light with how many seconds left? 15. So you'll see a yellow light with 15 seconds left in your remarks and ask you to be timely so that we have an opportunity for everyone who's here this evening to speak. So uh, Mr. Chuck Morris is our first speaker. Mr. Morris, welcome. You could state your name and address for the record. Can I let this down or do I have to You speak may first? briefly if that is required for speaking. Thank you. My name is Chuck Morris. I'm at 14 Winterberry Court, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, I want to just say to you all up front, it's not the reason I'm here, it's the reason I'm going to say this, is I appreciate everything you've done over the last year and a half to get our kids and our teachers safe. I know other people do not agree, but I would not want to be sitting in your positions, which I did for a number of years. I retired from here in 2004 and never thought I would ever speak before the Guilford County School Board again. But I'm here today because I am concerned about the plan to use the relief money from the federal government. I have gotten a copy of the May board uh, decision, have gone through it, and I want to say to the superintendent and her staff, I think they did an outstanding, excellent job in putting that plan together. 
there's nothing in that plan that I would not agree with in terms of supporting it. But what I'm here for is in going through that plan, only 15% of the money is going towards direct instruction for students. That concerns me. I would think that it would concern the board. I think it would concern the public. But our students fell so far behind in the last year and a half that they will never catch up unless we do intensive work with them. Now, folks are going to argue, well, there's not people out there. But I can tell you, and I don't know probably anybody left on this staff, that they are creative, they're innovative, and they can figure out how to use the staff they have to give those students more instruction to help them get caught up. I believe in many of the long-term things that are in that plan, but the problem is our kids are only going to be here for a certain number of years. And if we don't try to do something now, within the next year, year and a half, our kids will never catch up. I have not come before the board in all these years because I've been there. I know it's a tough job you have, but this one has just gotten to my heart in the fact that we have never had this kind of money to work with before and why we aren't using more of it to go towards instructing these students. I don't understand it. And I would just ask that this board and the superintendent take another look at that plan and at least at the minimum that 40 to 45 percent of that money go towards instruction direct instruction to students because if we don't do it now it won't get done and if we do it the same way we've been doing it it will make no difference i thank you continue the good work you've been doing and i appreciate the opportunity to be here thank Thanks you a lot thank you mr mark sherry stevenson no, not here. Michael Logan, if you could state your name and address efficiently for the record and pay attention to the lights. Thank you so much, Mr. Logan. My name is Michael Logan. I live at 5202 Rambling Road, Greensboro, North Carolina in District 3. I'm also a school teacher of 24 years on my 25th. Coming to work today, I passed three different school buses on the highway. All those buses were full of kids, and those buses were from outside of our county heading east, going on a field trip. Students in our county do not have that option, and students in our county need that option. I sat in a four-hour field trip to the media center last week. I had students asking me, can I go back to class? I don't want to sit here and watch this. Our students need outside opportunities of the classroom and field trips provide that opportunity. I would like to take my students to the National Guard. I do it every year or at least every other year. And my students get hands-on experience working on their vehicles. They should have that opportunity. We have students riding buses to school. We have students after school activities riding buses. Why can we not do field trips? They should be allowed. All right, on the second thing, our promise to our students, this was our 1822 plan. What goals have we met? Have we met any of the goals that we, we stated this was our promise to kids. Now, I do understand we've had a pandemic in the last year, and the kids were out of school for an extended amount of time, more than they should have been. Okay. This was our promise. What was the data? I cannot find the data for this. Where is that data now? Because we extended the superintendent's contract based off of performance. I want to see the data on that. And the public needs to see the data. It should be open. All right. School board meetings, as I've said, should be open. They should be transparent. They should be attended. We're missing. 
Decisions should be made with input from multiple sources, not just several or one. It should be multiple. All right. We're failing our students. We're failing the public. We should do better. And we can do better. And there are things that we can change to make it better. Thank you. Yep, I'm good. Thank you very much. And thank you for your service to our students. Mr. Jed O'Donnell was in the house. State your name and address, please, for the record. It's Jed O'Donnell, 1907 Madison Avenue, Greensboro, North Carolina. So I want to start off by extending my huge thank you, especially to Superintendent Dr. Contreras for all the support that you have shown me personally and the schools that I've served at. I also want to extend a huge thank you to all the board members for all your hard work as well serving our broader community. I came here 18 years ago to America, specifically North Carolina, Guilford County and Greensboro, because I believed in the values, I believed in the people and I believed in the place. And I still continue to believe in that. I've had the honor of serving students at Bessemer Elementary, Northeast Guilford High School, Montlew Academy of Technology, Kaiser Middle School, and now I serve as the proud principal of Grimsley Senior High School. And I'm here to share my support of the $1.7 billion referendum. As we all know, Grimsley is a very old but proud campus dating back over 100 years with multiple buildings. We face facility issues that impact our instruction each and every single day. We have buildings that are over nearly 100 years old and they are tired and we need your support. Our school would be one of the next on the list on the phase two of the bond referendum as a full renovation while still upholding the historic nature of our school. When the next phase of the bond referendum passes, Every school in our district, not just Grimsley, will have the technology and security upgrades. These upgrades are long, long overdue. Some of the examples that Grimsley faces each and every single day. We have crumbling walls and crumbling ceilings. We have a broken air conditioning system and broken heating. Inoperable camera systems, leaking roofs. And did I say crumbling walls and crumbling ceilings? However, we make it work at Grimsley every day because that is what we do. We are champions on the field and champions in the classroom. However, our classrooms are too small to properly serve all of our students. We do not have the sufficient spaces to facilitate the much needed collaboration or innovative teaching and learning that we should expect in our 21st century school. As the father, the proud father, of two school-age students who attend Linley Elementary and Kaiser Middle School and will eventually come to Grimsley. And a proud community member, I recognise the importance of investing in our schools and investing in our community. We need to put aside our differences. Realise that mistakes have been made and mistakes will continue to be made because we all make mistakes, but we learn from those mistakes. I, ho I hope that you will join me. That's it. You can close. You can finish your sentence. I hope that you join me in supporting the upcoming bond referendum. Our schools, our families, our teachers, our principals, and most importantly, our students deserve it. Thank you and go Willies. Thank you, Principal O'Donnell, and thank you for your service to our students. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Corson, did, did I pronounce that correctly, Mr. Corson? Sure thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Peace for Meadows, High Point. Uh, good evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm here because North Carolina is not very far from Virginia, and the Virginia school board stuff is really close to us. Um, however, North Carolina is the birthplace of freedom, all right? But the federal government isn't going to stop me from coming here. That's how I feel. All right. You are charged with not in charge of the education of our children. All right? And I want to ask, do you even know some of the students that you're fighting for? Do you know any of them? All right? 
Do you know any of the school situations that are underneath your care? All right. You might come back with, yes, because we just voted to fix all the old broken down buildings and we just heard the principal, you know, speak in his time to ask for your continued support in that measure, all right? But it doesn't take a genius for anybody to figure out that a 50-year-old building is crumbling and falling down, all right? I'm talking about more than just staffing shortages. I'm talking about staff members who are tired, teachers who are missing quality work with their families because they're using um, time-consuming and difficult programs that are hard to navigate and execute through, all right? Since I've lived here, all right, I've lived all over the United States, but since I've lived here, my school board representative for the school that my daughter and my son go to, and my oldest son went to another school as well, has been virtually non-existent in our school. It's interesting because her predecessor was always present at just about everything in the elementary school, middle school, and high school. And I asked a teacher at another school who has another rep, and they said the last time that they have seen anyone from the school board has been seven years since they've been down in the school. Seven. <clears throat> so I just wanted to let everyone know that we see that as parents, and it's important to come down to the schools where our students are, not just where some are, but all. <clears throat> and that's what I have for this time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Brad Simpson. Mr. Simpson, state your name and address for the record, and then the time will start. Brad Simpson, Longdale Drive. Longdale Drive. Thank you. Thank you for this evening. I'm here as a concerned parent here in Guilford County. We've all heard horror stories about what's being taught in a lot of the school systems across the country. I had submitted a FOIA Freedom of Information Act requesting a list of approved curriculum for grades pre-K pre through fifth grade. I've yet not rece received a response. Depending on who you're talking to, there are various opinions about who should be responsible for teaching parental values to our children. Some have the opinion that it's the school's responsibility, and others are of the opinion that it's the parent's responsibility. So which opinion is correct? Well, God's opinion is correct. We read in the Bible, children obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and your mother, things will go well for you. Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The school does have a role in teaching our children. And the role is, the school role is to not teach anything that contradicts the parent's values. The parent is responsible for teaching values to their children. So in front of these witnesses, I'm asking if you will commit to providing me with the approved curriculum for grades pre-K through fifth grade. Is there any reason that this request has not been sent to me. I went through the, your site, filled out the four-year request, and when I go on and look at it, it still says it's just submitted. It doesn't say anybody's working on it. So in front of these witnesses, will you commit that you will provide that information to me? We respond to all FOIA requests as required by law, but there is a backlog and a time lag on how to do that. So yes, you will receive so a response you to your FOIA. Okay. You, will res you will absolutely receive a response to your FOIA request. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Nolan Jones. Mr. Jones, if you state your name and your address for the record, thank you. I'm Nolan Jones and my address is out there. It's in front. Okay. My, my career began in an auditorium with 200 other students at the U.S. Army Defense Information School. The welcome to the school speech given by the command sergeant major opened with, look to the left, right, front, and back of you. They will not be there come graduation day. With that speech echoing in my brain, 
My computer programming class began with 22 students enrolled. Three months later, only nine students were able to achieve the academic standards to qualify for graduation. I was one of nine to earn designation of the U.S. Army 74 Fox computer programmer analyst. This was a paradigm shift that positively changed the direction of my life. Eleven days ago, the Associated Press published a news article stating that North Carolina schools had reported 35,000 third graders have been labeled as retained. This is a paradigm shift for 35,000 students that will negatively change the direction of their life, thus the state and nation as a whole. Your current level of consciousness cannot get these students to where they need to be. Over the past four years, I've been researching language scripts, studying the science of reading, and observing public behavior of children. So I could design, develop, implement a new intuitive keyboard app that I've named Keystack and patent in the US and Korea. I've demoed and product test Keystack at different locations across the country. The product testing consisted of a cross product evaluation of a user's functional interaction and behavioral attitude when using both QWERTY and Keystack keyboard apps. I would ask five and six year old students to type the alphabet using the QWERTY keyboard. It would take them more than two minutes to complete the task. I asked a four year old to type the alphabet. Within five seconds, he disengaged from the task and ran to the opposite side of the coffee store. Each child demonstrated a level of frustration when typing with the QWERTY keyboard. I would ask these same children to carry out and with the same task, but this time with the Keystack app. The five and six-year-olds could type the alphabet within 22 seconds or less. Upon their completion of the task, they made comments like, I love this, or it's way easier. This time, the four-year-old remained engaged with and completed the task with no behavioral signs of frustration while using the Keystack app. The student's desire to learn is being diminished because of an illogical design of the QWERTY keyboard. I now hope that your new level of consciousness can get all students to where they need to be. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Misty Reagan or Regan? Oh, you didn't want to ask me any questions, okay? No, you can say your name. Misty? Yep, Misty Reagan. And your address, please, for the record. I'm off of Burnett Drive in Guilford County. Okay, okay. Good evening. Tonight I want to discuss the resolution which will be presented, um, which states, the Guilford County Board of Education believes that educating the children of Guilford County is critical and essential to all citizens of Guilford County. Now, I can't argue with that. So let's take some time to discuss with the citizens of Guilford County what that looks like financially. We know that Guilford County Schools is slated to receive $307 million in emergency relief funds over the next four years. But where exactly is all the money going? The proposed ESSER investment plan allocates $21.5 million for, school, for summer school or fifth quarter, $15.6 million for extension of school year, $6.2 million for college career post-secondary advisory support, and $8.6 million to establish the newcomer school at Andrews for students from other countries to learn English. That's a total of $51.9 million. So how will that $51.9 million help reduce learning loss for all children in Guilford County Schools? Currently in Guilford County, there are only 38% of kindergarten through second grade children at grade level in math and only 44% at grade level in reading. That's a big problem. We also know that several schools in the school system have outdated HVAC units, which has been a concern for many years. The ESSER improvement plan also allocates $26.1 million to maintaining ventilation and improving air quality. But what about the $1.8 million previously allocated for safety and security improvements that was used for HVAC improvements? Were there any improvements made? If so, 
Why were their school days missed back in September because of non-working air conditioning? Now the proposal is to request county commissioners to place a $1.7 billion school construction bond, construction bond referendum on the March 2022 election ballot. With the county commissioner chair stating that he favors a sales tax increase when the county undergoes its tax reevaluation in 2022. Raising taxes in a time of economic hardship and job loss is not what's best for this community. Excessive spending on programs that have no impact on education for current students that experience the most learning loss over the last two years is negligent. Is this really the plan that will have citizens of Guilford County saying, boy, we made the decisions that made a difference in this community? Thank you. Susan Tisinger. Good evening. Susan Tysinger, 801 Blanton Place, Greensboro. Accountability is out the window. It's pretty amazing that graduation rates are up considering our kids were out of school for a year. Was that rate boosted by packets given to seniors to make up for all classes and schoolwork that they had missed? Giving credit where credit is not due doesn't teach our children to be accountable or honest or know how to meet deadlines. Is this about your image about, or about our children's education? And what about their safety? Emails and behavior you deem as threatening and questions from parents whom you continue to snub pushed you to install metal detectors here and employ four policemen to protect you. Meanwhile, guns are brought into our schools, children are attacked by outsiders in their classrooms, and school surveillance cameras are not working. You get the metal detectors and four police officers at a board meeting twice a month at a ratio of one police officer per eight or so people. Students enter school doors every day and one SRO at a ratio of one to 1,700. We have received $300 million in ESSER funds. Here's the plan. Do you know how much that is? We deserve to know how it's being spent, not just a casual outline, like this one. Even a PTSA budget of $30,000 is more detailed. $40 million in professional development. When will the development happen? $35 million for a teacher training center. You get shiny new rooms to use for your purposes while math and reading scores decline on a daily basis. $12 million allocated for strong post-secondary pathways. That could buy two and a half to three million tutoring hours so students can reach a post-secondary education. This money is about learning recovery, not more surveys, data managers, hiring friends, or personal gain. That leaves $200 million. Special programs and, and diversity training don't address learning loss. This plan is full of more bureaucracy and waste not honestly addressing what our children need. All of our kids need educating and competent teachers to cover every class. Many need one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Use the money to feed the kids who need it. Teach all the kids as they deserve it. Pay for real teaching materials for real learning of math, reading, science, history, music, and art. Social and emotional learning Want our kids to feel better about themselves? Don't give them excuses for failing. Instead, arm them with a good education. Stop wasting our money and toying with our kids' minds. Be accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry Pickett. So if you'll state your name and address. My name is Cherry Pikett. I live in Thoroughbred Run in Summerfield. Thank you. I'm, I'm an RN, and I have grandchildren in the Guilford County Schools. And I've been, for the past 20 months, been researching and reading everything that I could find on the COVID virus, the transmission, prevention, treatments, and the survival rates which for ages zero to 18, the survival rate is 99.999% per the CDC orders, as I'm sure that you all know that. 
you're supposedly basing this on the your uh, you're basing your decisions on the CDC recommendations, which is not at all backed by science. I've tried to understand your reasoning, and I must say it is angering that you have decided to place our kids in mask. Have you thoroughly researched all of this for yourself before making your decisions? As elected officials, your reasoning is missing a few things like science, evidence, common sense, and basic human decency. You are not to be making medical decisions about masking, testing, or injecting our children. That is for the parents alone to decide. The wearing of masks all day by our kids increases bacteria in their dry mouth, causes hypercapnia, increased carbon dioxide, dizziness, headache, anxiety, and recently uh, there have been dentists from New York to Raleigh saying they've seen an explosion in dental caries, and it's due to dry mouth or mask mouth. My granddaughter just had strep throat for the first time in her life a few weeks ago. And she told me this on her own. She said that a lot of the kids in her class are having headaches every day. The masks are actually a hindrance and uh, for learning, and it will put our children further behind in their education. I have here, um, I have read this over and over on your website. I have here in this hand the references that you list. Most of them are from the CDC, the NIH, um, the FDA, and I think there's one from Duke. And that's all, government references. In this hand, I have all the references that I've researched on why not to wear masks. And I'm going to leave these here with you. And this is what you list as to why to wear masks. Thank you. Thank you. You can leave those with Ms. Hip. I have Ronald Tuck next. Maybe that I was going to say, you don't look like Ronald, but my name's Winston, so I'm not one to judge. Um, no, Ronald Tuck. Are you Kenya Donaldson? How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Kenya Donaldson, 2406 Wheatfield Drive, Greensboro, North Carolina. I thank the Board of Education, Dr. Contreras, for your continued leadership. I am the GCAE president, and I stand on behalf of members and educators across our district. On your agenda today, you are discussing a $1.7 billion bond referendum. Students and educators across our district applaud your tenacity regarding addressing the deterioration of our buildings in our district. The infrastructure and capital outlay of our buildings have been neglected for far too long. There is a cost associated with maintaining safe and healthy buildings. Educators and students deserve a unanimous approval of the bond referendum proposal that's on the table today. As with all issues, GCAE keeps students and staff at the center of its advocacy efforts. With that said, we ask the board and district leadership to remember we are continuing to teach in the midst of a pandemic. Often stated from this particular dais, the single most influential indicator of a child's learning success and learning success is the students educators. GCAE maintains that educators are school personnel that work with children every day all of our personnel. With that said, I appeal to the board to also consider the human capital of our district when making decisions. Thank you for maintaining a mask mandate to this day. Masks are no fun as I stand here with my glasses fogging up. I get that. 
However, they are what we need to remain safe as educators in our classrooms. Please vote yes for required masking in our district. Thank you for the paid classroom coverage for middle school and high school levels. Compensation for lost planning times makes up for a lot of the work our middle school and high school educators are putting in when they're subbing for their staff members who are out for COVID. Thank you. Let's continue to explore how we can support our support staff who are also subbing in our schools when people are out for COVID. Thank you for our bonuses for our classified staff. Thank you for also the bonuses for our select staff at hard to staff schools and difficult to staff positions in our district. Let's continue to expand on bonuses to motivate colleagues to remain in GCS. We are literally one area code away from bonuses that re, um, provide incentive for people to stay, retention and bonuses, as well as signing bonuses. I do not have all the information you have before you to make these decisions, but I trust your leadership and look forward to seeing you make decisions in the best interest of educators as well as students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donaldson. Uh, Sylvia Clapp White. Come on down. It's like the price is right. Good evening. Respected Guilford County School members. Ms. Clapp, I just I'm sorry. your name and address for the um, record, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sylvia Clapp White. I live at Cordella Drive in Greensboro. Thank you. Respected Guilford County School members. I'm a Greensboro resident and feel strongly that many of our schools are in dire need of repair and updates. It is my understanding that the average school in this district is 54 years old. In 2020, the Guilford County Board of Commissioners had the opportunity to repair, rebuild our schools, but they failed our children by only approving a $300 million bond referendum instead of the requested $2 million bond referendum. The voters approved the $300 million bond and elected three new pro-education commissioners, shifting the makeup of our local county commission. Tonight, you can ask the Guilford County Board of Commissioners to put a $1.7 billion school construction bond referendum on the 2022 election ballot. I am asking you to support this recommendation. Please remember as you prepare to vote that many of our schools cannot be equipped with the necessary security systems to protect our children at a time when our community is facing many challenges with school violence and safety being discussed daily. This money will be effective. New and better equipped facilities, peace of mind for children and their families, and we will be able to attract businesses willing to move to the city, knowing our educational facilities are state of the art. It is time to make all children a priority. Making a difference early in a child's life could have a positive impact individually and for the greater good. I hope you agree that our children deserve better. Funding the needed school bond lifts and benefits us all. Thank you so much for all you do. And I know you will do the right thing for our children. Thank you very much. Michelle Thigpen, come on down. You might have to like play music, get people to jog in like on the... Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Thigpen, 5105 Leary Court, Summerfield, North Carolina. As you know, I am the proud president of the Guilford County Council of PTAs, as well as the proud principal of Southwest Elementary School. I am speaking tonight in support of the board and the superintendent as you move to address the unmet school capital needs in Guilford County. On behalf of the Guilford County Council of PTAs, we would like to thank the Guilford County citizens for their overwhelming approval for the $300 million bond that was passed this past year. This act reflects strong leadership and community support for public education in Guilford County. Yet, we know 
that recent bond was just the beginning of what is needed to help ensure our schools have what they need to safely and effectively provide what is needed to our school communities. After all, the GCS facilities master plan recommendations call for an overall investment in school capital of over $2 billion. The most recent bond covers less than 20% of those needs. More must be done for our schools. We must act urgently to effectively address the following. The existing school overcrowding problems, the projected growth patterns throughout Guilford County, the repairs and renovations that are desperately needed in existing facilities, the need to build new schools to better support high yield teaching and learning strategies throughout the entire school environment, as well as address the outdated technology infrastructure and school safety for our schools. These challenges continue. We must act now to address them. This bond will not only address the immediate needs of our schools, but will also lay the foundation for future opportunities and future prosperity for the entire Guilford County community. Thank you all for your leadership as you work to address these issues and consider an upcoming school bond to ensure that all schools are equipped to meet the needs of all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your service to students, educators, and families. I may not get this last name right, so I hope you'll correct me, Michelle Skyandra or Chandra. I hope you'll state it correctly for the record. No worries, of course. Michelle Chandra. Chandra yes, ma'am. Um, Michelle Chandra, Oak Ridge, North Carolina. And Allison Bennett, Summerfield. We're tag team in it. Yep. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for your time this evening. Um, as principals of Pierce and Stokesdale Elementary School, we want to share our support for the $1.7 billion construction bond referendum. When we go decades without investing in our schools, we have to be bold and we need to realize the state of our schools is directly related to the state of our community. Every August and September, we have schools that have to close due to emergency HVAC repairs. The same thing happens in January and February when the heating systems are too old to even order parts for. All schools would benefit from this bond. Even newer schools in GCS are in need of such things such as heating and air conditioning updates and roof leaks. We strongly advocated for phase one of the bond this last April, but the $300 million only gets to eight of our schools. This next phase includes technology and safety upgrades for all 126 schools. That is something that we cannot afford to pass on. <clears throat> the livelihood of our economic development in Guilford County depends on passing this bond, which has the potential to bring 10,000 jobs to the community. The capital money we have historically received is enough for one HVAC project, just one. Our staff do the best they can to maintain buildings that are in disrepair, but this strategy is not working and our students and staff members deserve far better learning environments. Whether you have students in our schools or not, these upgrades and renovations tie directly to real estate value. We should not have to take parents on tours of our schools and ask them to watch out for the trash cans in the hallways that are catching the rain from the leaking roofs. What remains unique about public schools is that we serve every single student that walks in our door. And I hope that our community understands how important it is to make up for decades of underfunding by supporting the bond resolution in March. Thank you. Thank you both for your service to students and educators. Um, okay, let me get back and uh, Mr. James Dewey, come on down. Good evening, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. My name is James Dewey. My wife, Rebecca, and I have been in Greensboro 
For about 20 years now, uh, we are the parents of four children, ages 13 to 21, all products of Guilford County Schools. Uh, I am here tonight to support the bond referendum and the bond initiative. I know you've heard from a number of speakers about the importance of supporting this initiative. And I wanted to share a personal story with you that I think helps underscore that message. Um, I received a phone call earlier this year from a childhood friend named John. John and I grew up in Indiana together. John had gotten an engineering degree, a PhD, and a law degree, and made a great career for himself in Silicon Valley. He called me to say he and his wife wanted a lifestyle change. They wanted a different environment in which to raise their two little children. While they'd never been to North Carolina before, uh, they heard great things and wanted to come and visit. So they did. They came to um, Greenville, South Carolina, through Charlotte, Greensboro, and on to the Triangle. We hosted them, showed them the community, and talked to them about living in North Carolina and raising a family here in Greensboro. He called me about a month after that trip and said, we are coming to North Carolina, we're moving, and we've decided to move to the Triangle. Uh, he said that they love Greensboro, can envision themselves living here. His work would be remote, but their deciding factor was choosing the best public school system they felt for their children. And while I was happy for them, I thought of what a missed opportunity was for Greensboro. Think of the hundreds of thousands of other Americans every year who move to North Carolina from other states. And how many of those go through that same comparative analysis, ask themselves those same questions, and come to the same conclusions that John did? Um, you know, we must support our most critical infrastructure, and I submit to you that there is no more important factor in attracting and retaining top talent, future generations of leaders and workers and their families to a community than a healthy public school system. Consider the opportunity lost, the opportunity cost of not attracting John and the countless other individuals and businesses who make those same decisions and look at the state of a public school. Uh, system. Of course, investments like this, as with any investment, comes at a cost. But it's important for you as leaders and we as a community to, to also weigh that cost against the greater cost of complacency and inaction. So I urge you to support this critical investment in our community and its future. Mr. Thank Dewey, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Melvin Marshall. Welcome, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board Members, Dr. Contreras. I'm Melvin Marshall, resident at 4450 River Force Lane here in Greensboro. Good evening, everyone. I am Melvin Marshall, proud principal at Ben L. Smith High School. I just want to share with you the need to pass the upcoming $1.7 billion bond resolution. Eight of my fellow colleagues are in the design phases of their own school projects under the current $300 million bond that was successfully passed in April of this year. However, the first phase of this $300 million bond did not reach even one single high school. Ben L. Smith would be on the list for full renovation if the next phase of the bond passes. I can personally tell you just how desperately our school is in need of these upgrades. Some of the examples of our school facility issues that we've experienced so far in my tenure at Ben O. Smith, we have a number of classroom and office spaces without consistently working air conditioning or heating, classrooms without adequate ventilation or lighting. We also have classrooms where science lab stations still run on its original wiring and gas lines from the 1960s. Classrooms and office spaces where existing carpeting or floors that cannot be replaced out of fear or concerns of harmful and outdated insulation that were originally installed when our school was first built and opened in 1963. We have existing infrastructures that can no longer simply be repaired, but they must now be completely replaced. All schools will have technology and other safety upgrades if the next phase of this bond passes successfully. Every single student and every single teacher in our school district will certainly deserve that. Smith High School is slated to be an advanced manufacturing, gaming, and design innovation, 
and green construction school that will directly impact the economic development of our entire city. If you have any doubt about the state of our school's facility, I cordially invite you to visit us at 2407 South Holden Road in Greensboro. We're located directly behind Four Seasons Town Center and also the Curry Convention Center. I am committed to the students and staff at Ben O. Smith High School. However, I do want to take the time to make sure that I emphasize the importance of this bond to be passed in support of our students and our staff at Ben O. Smith High School. So please join me in supporting the upcoming bond resolution. Thank you for your time and consideration on this evening. Thank you, Mr. Marshall, for your service and leadership. We appreciate you. Uh, Kimberly Gatling is with us this evening. Welcome. Good evening. I am Kimberly Gatling, and my husband and I are parents of a senior at Page High School and fourth and fifth graders at Jesse Wharton Elementary School. The North Carolina Constitution addresses a right to education, and it expressly states that it is the duty of state and local government to provide a uniform system of free public schools where an equal opportunity shall be provided for all students. How are we providing equal opportunity for all students in Guilford County when new, beautiful, non-GCS schools continue to open across our county, whereas the facilities in Guilford County schools continue to decline to such a state that they cannot adequately serve our children. Everything from severe overcrowding, including the cafeteria at my son's high school, which physically cannot accommodate all of the students, to failing HVAC systems, deteriorating roofs, and inadequate bathroom facilities. Aside from being a parent of GCS students, I am an active member of the Greensboro business community. I understand very well the impact of having good schools on economic development, and particularly recruiting corporations and much needed jobs to this area. Guilford County is a fantastic place to live and to raise children. And we should be focused on making our public school system a point of pride when we are recruiting companies to come to this area. It is time for our community leaders and citizens to stop politicizing the clear and present issues that are in our facilities and our schools. We need to focus on providing equal opportunities for all children to have a free education as mandated by the North Carolina Constitution. Let's stop putting band-aids on these long unaddressed facilities issues and put the resources into what's needed to bring every school in our county up to par. I therefore stand in full support of the $1.7 billion construction bond referendum for the March ballot, and I solicit your support for the same. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Gatling. Eric Nagley, come on down. Good evening. As the proud principal of Page High School, I do want to thank our Board of Education, Board of County Commissioners, and the residents of Guilford County for passing the $300 million bond this past April. Eight of my fellow principals have projects that are in the design phase, and we look forward to seeing those results. I am here this evening to show my support for this resolution as a parent of three and soon to be four GCS students and as a principal of Page High for all of my students, family, families, and our community. Unfortunately, the 300 million bond did not reach one high school in GCS based on the facility's master plan. Page High School is slated for phase two, which will require our community to pass the 1.7 billion construction bond referendum for this upcoming March. This bond also has the opportunity to touch every single school and every single student across GCS, which is very exciting. Page High School has so much to be proud of with a rich history of community support, a strong and dedicated staff, and students that take great pride as Page Pirates. However, our building is falling apart. Some examples include a failing AC and heating system, 
a cafeteria that you previously heard about that sits only 350 students for a school of close to 2,000, an auditorium that is falling apart with seats that haven't ever been replaced, and a light system in there that doesn't work for our performers, a leaking roof causing multiple trash cans that you guys have heard a lot about this evening that is much more than 10 that have to be set out in the hallways during rainy times, mobile units that have been temporary, supposedly, since 1973. Gym locker rooms with little ventilation and inadequate lockers, inadequate bathroom facilities for staff and students, classrooms that are small, that are separated by partitions instead of permanent walls. I want our students and families to have access to a learning environment that they can be proud of. We owe it to our students to make sure they have technology and security upgrades improvements to athletic facilities and access to collaborative learning spaces that will help them prepare for their success beyond high school. We have been putting band-aids on capital needs in this district, in this county for decades. And you can tell when you are in buildings each and every day, like I am. The state of our schools has a direct impact on economic development in Guilford County. And as a father and community member, this is also critically important. I do hope that for the students, families, and school leaders, that each of you will fully support this much needed bond in March. We talk, for our students at, we talk to our students at Page about dreaming big. Let's provide them with the facilities that will help them accomplish these huge dreams, which will change our communities for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagley. We appreciate your service as well. Ashley Triplett. Come on down. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Ashley Triplett, and I reside at 6008 Dawn Ridge Trail, Greensboro, 27410. Members of the Board of Education, along with Superintendent Dr. Sharon Contreras, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. I am here representing the current Peck Elementary pre-K through fifth grade school as Peck's proud principal and also a representative for what will become the Peck K-8 Expeditionary Learning School. In my office, I have a black and white photo of Walt Disney standing on a vacant lot in Kissimmee, Florida, the same land that later became Walt Disney World. Also in the photo is the well-known quote by Disney himself, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. I often visit the vacant plot of land currently proposed for the new K-8 Expeditionary Learning School and often think of what Disney accomplished. He dreamed big and he created a place of joy, learning, and boundless opportunities. We can now do what is no longer impossible. Thank you to the $300 million bond supported by the board, our superintendent, and our community. For the children of Guilford County Schools, the impossible is possible. On behalf of the pet community, thank you. The architectural firm SHP and the project manager for the current bond, High Caps, have listened carefully to our students and families and soon the community about their hopes and dreams for their new facility. One pet kindergarten teacher dreams about collaboration spaces for students and staff. A second grade teacher hopes for a meditation room. Our students wrote letters and drew pictures to share their hopes and dreams. One third grader said, I hope my new school is adventurous. I also want a kindness center where we can make gifts. Our fifth grade class said they wanted a swirly slide, a greenhouse, and smart lighting. Another student's hopes and dreams for his school are that the school has a laboratory, better technology, a student store, and a waterfall. Our school is represented by students and staff from 20 different countries and territories, including Malawi, Nicaragua, Pakistan, Panama, and Tanzania. Over one fifth of our students are English learners. Over 80% of our student population identifies as black or Hispanic, and our mobility rate is 15%. We have to ensure that we fulfill our obligation as the adult members of the community to provide learning spaces that empower and enrich students' lives rather than be hindered by crumbling facilities with pipes that drain into classrooms, broken tiles in the hallways, or HVAC systems that do not provide adequate heating or cooling. 
Our students and our community deserve bright, beautiful, flexible learning spaces, not designed only for the students of 2021, 22, or 23, but also for the students of generations to come. Imagine the learning, the enthusiasm, and the life-changing opportunities our students will experience when they have learning facilities that are as bright, beautiful, and amazing as they are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Triplett, for your service as well to students and educators. Denise Francisco. Good evening, Denise Francisco. I am the proud principal of Northwest Guilford Middle School. I live at 304 North Eugene Street in Greensboro. I stand before you tonight not only as an employee, but also a former parent and a product of this school system, graduating from Western Guilford High School many years ago. I have had the experience of attending and working in numerous schools in our district and was even a part of the design team that built the addition at Peeler Open School for the Performing Arts back in 2005. We knew then, as we were designing that space, that students needed open and innovative spaces to learn and classrooms that allowed for movement and collaboration. It breaks my heart to see the damage from the tornado and recent fire that will cause Peeler to be demolished. I attended the former Guilford Middle School, and I also worked at Kaiser Middle, so I know firsthand how bad both of those schools needed to be replaced. I am not surprised at all that Guilford Middle has now been replaced, and Kaiser is near the top of the list of schools to be replaced from the first bond referendum. The former Guilford Middle and Kaiser Middle both remind me in many ways of Northwest Middle. All designed as former junior high schools, they do not provide the innovative learning spaces that students and staff deserve. Kaiser is being replaced from the first bond referendum and Northwest Middle should be replaced as well. The 300 million from the first bond is being used to meet the needs of many students, but we need the additional $1.7 billion bond referendum for the next group of schools that need to be replaced. Northwest Middle was built in 1970, over 50 years ago. I don't know if any of us can remember a time when the school was not over capacity. There are literally 17 mobile units that are completely inadequate for the class sizes that are forced to learn in those spaces. Now let me be clear, we always make it a great day to be a Viking, and we have the most dedicated facilities team at the school level and also in our district's maintenance department. But there is barely a day that goes by that we do not have maintenance staff on site for plumbing, carpentry, HVAC, lock issues, leaks, window repair, pest control, etc. On any given day, we can have one to three work orders in place due to our aging facility. I cannot fathom the amount of district facility money spent on utilities and keeping this school operating this way. We are so overcrowded that we had to turn the front commons into a second cafeteria. Our drama department learns in a mobile unit with no access to a stage or performance area. One of our band classrooms is on the same hall with sixth graders and they learn to the constant sound of drums and musical instruments playing throughout the day. Most of our classrooms are not equipped with even basic ceiling mounted projectors, much less any amount of smart technology. Our students deserve so much more. A dream for them to learn in innovative, spacious, technology rich classrooms. They should be taught in spaces that encourage teamwork and collaboration with technology that mirrors the world they will one day work in. In closing, I strongly advocate for the inclusion of the bond referendum on the next ballot. Thank you very much, and thank you as well for your service. Mr. Townsend, Eric Townsend, is that correct? Welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Townsend. I am the parent of a Kaiser Middle School student and a Sternberger Elementary School student. I'm a vice president on the Sternberger PTA, and I serve as secretary of the Guilford County Council of PTAs. So there have been several speakers that have been very eloquent in expressing their support for the bond referendum, um, and I'm just going to add to that. You have my full support to rebuild our schools, even to the tune of $1.7 billion. Um, let's be honest, some of our schools are a broken water fountain away from being designated a Superfund site, and that's just not acceptable. While a school is surely more than a physical space, that space is still important. A space nurtures students, it protects them, it inspires them to want to learn. This resolution, it treats our schools as an investment, not a cost, and I think that's important. 
I sometimes hear critics of public schools and of government in general say that government and schools should run more like a business. And that's interesting because what I don't hear from them is that in business, you have to spend money to make money. And the return on investment from the 1.7 billion in this resolution added to the 300 million from last year, would be more jobs, better jobs, and a stronger community. So thank you for your support of tonight's resolution. I ask that you all support it and vote in favor of sending it to the commissioners. Thank you for your service on the board. I know it's been a trying time these past few months with some of the um, uh, folks that have come and expressed themselves for a variety of reasons. But know that you can count on me to rally support for this referendum if it makes it to the ballot in March. Thank you. Thank you very much for your volunteer service to the PTAs. Susan Steen. Welcome. Thank you. So my name is Susan Steen. My address is 1718 Windsor Drive, High Point. And I'm the principal at Northwood Elementary in High Point. And I'm here to express my, um, that I support the bond referendum. Northwood is one of the schools that would benefit from this next round of the bond referendums. We are scheduled to be completely torn down and rebuilt, and there are lots of reasons why that needs to happen. I wrote down just a few, so I would remember all of them. Um, but we, our building was built in 1959. In addition to the old building, we have 13 mobile units that are in poor working condition. Many of the conditions in our classrooms and mobile units are not ideal learning spaces. We have one classroom with a cracked, uneven floor that bugs crawl up through the crack from under the building sometimes. Um, we have exposed pipes and ductwork in the ceilings and in the hallways. In a recent health inspection, the inspector noted that our overhead piping and ducts had condensation on them and were not able to be cleaned properly. These pipes are also leaking due to their age. Last year, the pipe in our computer lab burst and water went all over all of our computers. And maintenance told us that that's going to continue happening just because of the age of our pipes. Um, our, loop, our roof leaks every time it rains um, throughout the building. Maintenance has worked on it multiple times, but it continues to leak. We have leaks that come in through the baseboards in our main hallways when it rains a lot. We had a staff member who fell a couple weeks ago when it was raining heavily and the water was in. Despite all we do to keep it dry, it continues to come in every time it rains. Our mobile units, our 13 mobile units, all have leaky roofs. The doors are all rusted. The carpets have water stains on them. One ceiling from one of our mobile units collapsed last year because of the water. So there are lots of reasons that Northwood would benefit from this bond referendum, from being rebuilt. And as I started thinking about all these things, I also wanted you to hear the positive of what's going on. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you all the good things that are going on, because I would venture to say that when parents come into Northwood, when parents come into these other schools you've heard about tonight, when visitors come in, they don't see all these things I'm talking about, because teachers are masters at making their classrooms and their schools inviting places for students. Teachers have a knack of putting a bright, colorful poster over that peeling paint, so students don't notice that peeling paint or putting a piece of furniture over that cracked floor so that students don't know that cracked floor is there. So I want to applaud our teachers and staff at Northwood and teachers and staff across our district who are making the most of working conditions that are not ideal conditions for them, that are not ideal learning conditions for our students, but our teachers are making the most of it. So despite all the obstacles, we're doing a great job with what we have. So in closing, I would just like to implore you to approve the resolution requesting the county commissioners place the school referendum on the, on the ballot in March of 2020. There are lots of economic reasons, but bottom line is the right thing to do for children, staff, and our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership and service. Tequila Smith, Tequila. I'm not sure I've pronounced that right. Please correct me if I haven't. It's Tequila Smith. You state your name and address, and then you have three minutes. Tequila Smith, 508 Memphis Street, Greensboro. What I want to talk about tonight is the lack of respect and customer service that I have received from Gifford County Schools. I have two kids that are in the EC department. On August the 24th, my son was assigned to Homebound Services. Needless to say, they never got started. 
it took me until October the 4th to get anything done. And school started on the 24th. That is too long. The teacher they assigned, she contacted me twice and never again. So essentially, you guys paid a teacher for not teaching my child when I taught him every day. When I talked to Miss Christie and let her know this, she laughed at me. That is unacceptable to be treated like that. And quite frankly, you guys don't care about kids in the AC department, not one bit. I have another child whom I have been battling with your department, wanting to take him off of NCVPS when he was placed there by Miss Tina Santiago. I have been harassed and bullied. You guys have a no bullying policy, which should go for parents also from administration. I get emails telling me that, hey, I'm your child's new EC teacher. He needs to be online at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Who in their right mind is gonna have their child online that long? Kids need to be kids also. He does his schoolwork from 10 to 4. After 4 p.m., he's not getting back online to learn with any teacher. If teachers don't have the audacity to call me and ask me what kind of schedule my child can do, don't email me something impersonal as that, because that is just wrong. Don't have attitudes with me. I don't expect to get laughed at by any one working for Gifford County, because you work for the student and the parents. And quite frankly, your customer service really does suck. I emailed each and every last one of you over the summer to find out what was going to happen with kids for virtual learning. I got no response. Although you, Ms. Sharon Contreras, sent me an email last year stating that you would speak with me and you never have. So this all technically falls back on you. You are supposed to be a leader. You don't lead your departments. You just let them go and do whatever they want to do and talk to parents any kind of way bully us into doing what you guys want us to do instead of asking parents what fits for their child within the EC department. I am very ashamed of Gifford County Schools, ashamed to even tell anybody my kids attend this school system or that it is a great school system because you guys are not. That's all I have to tell you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I'm sorry you've had this experience. I'm asking uh, Chief of Schools Marshall Matson to connect with you to make sure that you do get the response. But Marshall will introduce you to the staff people and make sure that you get the kind of response you need. Thank you. Okay, next. I may not get this name right. Laura? Rabadon Valentin, no, nope, not here. Okay. Brandon Jackson, thank you. If you'll just again state your name and address, and then you have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. My name is Brandon Jackson. I live at 1601A Randman Road. I have a first grader that currently goes to Faust Elementary. She loves Faust, uh, from the teachers to the students to learning something every day. She comes home happy, happier than most kids nowadays at school. Um, I'm looking forward to this construction for Faust Elementary because it gives us a chance to expand the grounds and let the kids be kids, have bigger grounds to grow, uh, let them meet more students, be, uh, build bigger bonds so that they can grow up to see the community as it is and how they can help improve the community themselves instead of uh, somebody saying, go do this, go do that, thinking that it will help, it, help the community when it's only helping a certain person. Um, uh, like I said, she loves it. There, there, there's no better school than I could think of that I would send my child to other than Faust. The teachers, they communicate with uh, us as parents. They let us know how our child are doing, what they can do to improve, and the next activity or fun activity that's going to happen the following week. Um, the principal, Mr. Dixon, he calls us every, every week, uh, Friday or Saturday. It doesn't matter. He calls us and lets us know, hey, we're doing this this week. Please have your child prepared. They let us know ahead of time what they de what they need, what they do not do not need, and where they can go to get what they need. Um, other than that, I approve of the Faust Elementary rebuilding construction plan. Thank you very much for coming this evening and sharing your experience. No problem. Thank you. Janet Holland.
Hi, I'm Janet Holland. I'm speaking on the behalf of Allen J Elementary about the upcoming bond. I've been at Allen J Elementary for seven years and I've seen it develop into a staple within our community. And yet our school is doing a disservice to the students who attend there. Being a 21st century teacher, I appreciate the one-on-one -on -one devices you've given us and programs like Canvas and Nearpod, I use them daily. But often our older building has been having some big issues with technology. Having readers within every classroom or every other classroom, we're still having major issues with internet. It can take anywhere from two to 10 minutes for one one minute video to load. On top of that, sometimes our Nearpods and Canvas won't even load properly. During this time, our students are losing attention, their focus and engagement while having to wait. This technology is here to keep them engaged in their learning, but it's not happening due to our building. And speaking of devices, some of our devices are older. Um, our technology carts, the projectors, the document cameras within them are falling apart if we can find all the proper cords that connect within them. Um, there's also issues with them just connecting, loading, or even being so blurry the students can't see what you're trying to project to them. Now, this is just the beginning of our woes and our worries here at our school. Trying to keep your class engaged and focused in learning while a lizard runs across your classroom into the, from the cabinet into the crack on the floor is difficult to do, and I've done it this year already. And speaking of the floor, the hallway within our main building is caving in. And yes, the county has came to fix it multiple times and it's still caving in. There are parts where you can put your foot underneath it. That same spot during big storms often leaks. Now I've been at the building for seven years and I love my job. I've had two separate classrooms lose heat during the winter. Now trying to teach in when your classroom is 63 degrees to third graders is quite difficult. They're cold and I'm gonna be honest, I was pretty chilly. Now an older building can be charming, but at times when it affects the internet with devices working or usually not, losing student engagement and creatures appearing and disappearing often, the building's falling apart and there's so much more we can do and it needs to happen sooner than later at Allen J because this affects our students in our future. They did get, they need what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service as a teacher. Okay, that was, um, Adelba Astiana, if I, please state your name, make sure I got that correct yes. for the record, thank you. Good evening to all. My name is Anelba Ostiana Ramos, and I have worked for GCS Families for the past 14 years. Today, I am excited about the possibility of our students, our Faust population, to have a new building, a safe place to learn, a place in which our students feel excited about learning and in which they can be exposed to fun, new ways of doing, doing things. This population, which is mainly composed of minorities, has waited long enough for a new school, a new place to learn. A big school, big enough um, with different areas available to stimulate their brains, a large gym in which to exercise indoors, a spacious media center full of books and tech devices, a bigger 21st century learning space or even access to water safe enough to drink. Today, I am reaching out to the board so that they can consider funding for our schools to complete the great projects that are envisioned to serve our minorities with equity and social justice. Approving the bond, the 1.7 billion bond, seems to me as a very minimal investment that can greatly determine the future of this city. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and for your service to students and families. Kelly Haxtell. If you also state your name, make sure I got that right. Thank you. Thank you. You did. It is Kelly Haxtell. Um, I am a pre-K teacher at Allen J Elementary, and I'm also the proud mother of four GCS um, students, two high schoolers, one at GTCC High Point Middle College, one at Ragsdale, and two that actually go to my school. 
Um, so I'm here on behalf of Allen J Elementary, and I'm also um, who I have two a, four, a second grader and a fourth grader. While the conditions at my student school are um, at all of their schools are are need of improvement, I came to speak today specifically about Allen J. Um, as a teacher at Allen J Elementary, I'm a pre-K teacher there. Um, our pre-K class is our home. We are housed in a trailer on the campus. We've been in that trailer for um, the four years that I've been there, and that trailer's been sitting there for over 40 years. So imagine being in your home where your children learn through play, and they play on that floor um, that is lightly covered by a beautiful, colorful carpet that has foam squares on it, and it's moldy. It's stain filled. This is where they spend the majority of their time each and every day. Um, so thinking about that and the ceiling tiles that have spots on it, that sanitation fails every year. Every six months we get a sanitation um, report. We're in the classroom, you're thinking someone's in your bathroom because you're hearing all this commotion in there. We have leaky, leaky sinks. The toilet runs constantly. Con continuously. The children are afraid at sometimes to even go toward the bathroom because they think someone's in there. I know you've heard so much about the conditions of the schools and specifically our school because it was built in 1955. Trailers were supposed to be a temporary fix which have become a permanent solution. I don't want um, it to go unnoticed that you guys do a tremendous job of trying to meet the needs of our, of our community and our school district. However, the, the trailers, the safetyness, the safety of our children are at risk. I don't want um, to be in a situation this school year or moving forward um, where my child or my children um, and my students have to be um, evacuated in an emergency situation. I know that the tornadoes that happened a couple of years back in the schools where the, the trailer at Hampton Elementary was completely demolished in seconds. In seconds. I want you to keep that at the forefront of your mind as you um, request, request the $1.7 billion for the bond referendum to add um, trying to say, the monies for um, the March ballot. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your service. Michelle Atchison, or Atkinson, if you'll make sure I got that correct. Thank you. You didn't. <laughs> it's Atchison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Michelle Atchison, and I am the curriculum facilitator. Excuse me, curriculum facilitator at Allen J Elementary. I've worked at Allen J for the last twenty years of my career, all of my career. I am devoted to my school and the diverse community that surrounds us so much so that my own sons have attended school there. I have taught them to advocate for what they need and tonight I'm advocating for my community. My first year at Allen J was in 2001 and I taught in a trailer teaching 28 fourth graders in a trailer that was already 20 years old. So that trailer is about 40 years and it's still there being used. I came in as a new teacher, excited about teaching with technology that I learned about in college that our school didn't have and still doesn't have. We're thrilled to have one-on-one -on -one devices for our students. We really, really are. <laughs> but our internet isn't always the best and definitely not to the level to help us teach our kids to be 21st century learners and become competitive in the workplaces of their futures. I'm proud of our school and our staff for making do with what we have and our community for embracing and working with us even during such hard times like last year. But I would love for the school board to vote to show them that they do deserve a school building and facilities that show them that you believe in them and in their futures. Thank you for your time and considering the future of our students. Thank you so much for your longtime service to our students. We appreciate it. Carla Flores Ballesteros. Carla Flores Ballesteros, 4351 Twisting Creek Drive, High Point. Good evening, board members, Dr. Contreras. First of all, I would like to thank you for the work that you do. I know it's not easy. 
but we appreciate all you do to serve our students. Second, I come to you to highlight the importance of your support on the request to the Board of Commissioners to place the 1.7 billion school construction bond referendum on the March 2022 election ballot. As a proud principal at Allen J Elementary, I see our scholars, teachers, staff, and community working together to provide the best education and opportunities for our scholars to excel and become productive global citizens. Unfortunately, our buildings do not mirror the amazing experiences, learning opportunities, and caring that happens day in and day out in our classrooms. Yes, I said buildings. Allen J has six different buildings and seven mobile units in very poor condition. Our students have to walk through the rain, wind, you name it, from building to building. And that's not okay. Our first building was built in 1955. Our old and deteriorated buildings are consistently patched for us to continue serving our scholars and their families. Let me give you just an example. For the last 10 to 15 years, our main building has been settling to the point where walls have cracks. There are gaps between doors and shelves that once were touching the floor are not longer doing that. They seem to be floating. Cabinet doors cannot be closed because of gravity. So we have to secure them in very creative ways. Thousands and thousands of dollars have been spent on trying to level the ground from injecting foam to filling the floor with sand under the tiles and redoing the floors. I believe that our district does the very best to allocate funds to keep our buildings standing and running. Our maintenance department works diligently to keep up with the work orders they receive every day. Our buildings are in these conditions to, due to the lack of funding. And I know that we can work together to pass uh, this um, petition to have the $1.7 billion. Allen J is one of the most diverse communities in the county. It is a caring and loving community, and our students and our community deserve the very, very best. The true mean of our character is how we treat others, and advocating for this is how we treat our students. Thank you. Thank you so much for your service and leadership. Lisa Williams. Are you Ms. Williams? Yes, yes you are. I Hi. Am. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Superintendent, as well as board members. Uh, my name is Lisa Williams, and I am the very proud principal of Sternberger Elementary School. Um, I come to you tonight because we really need your support. Uh, if you come to my school, if you were to ask us what makes Sternberger so special, we are really big on relationships, relationship building. We also recently have become very, very good at camouflaging. We're camouflaging what we call our flaws, our flaws with our building. And that's very unfortunate for our students. There are many days in our building where we have no heat or insufficient heat. We also have inconsistent air conditioning. We have rain that's coming down in our classrooms. I had to relocate a class just today because of the effects of the rain. This, our children deserve better than this, and we really need to work together to make sure that this bond referendum goes forward. I'd also like to thank GCS Maintenance because we have called them time and time again. And every time they do come, they do try to fix the issue. I know their hands are tied. It's like putting a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid. And what will eventually happen is that Band-Aid's gonna come off but you still have the root of the problem. 
Our teachers do an excellent job at making sure that school and classes are as appropriate for our students as they can. They're coming to school also in this heat. Our students deserve better. The solution is easy. It's to support the bond referendum. We need this for our students. We need this for our future. I'm asking you to please keep this in mind and help our school continue to be the world changers that we are. Thank you. Ms. Williams, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you. Sahad or Sajad Khan, if you'll make sure I've got that pronunciation correct for the record. Uh, yes, that's right. And uh, my name is Sajad Khan, and my address is 201 Thomas Street and High Point. I actually uh, support for all Guilford County Schools and especially for LNJ Elementary School. They have a lot of problems, like before, I don't know how I explained her name, but I call her Miss uh, Principal. Like she said before, a uh, lot of uh, like, uh, rains uh, come in the uh, school and uh, parking lot and drive through. They have a lot of problems. They need to be to fix, and uh, they have a, a trailer and a bath school. They need to be uh, replaced and water uh, damage. And that's why I come to work our sport for our Guilford County School. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Amy Harrison. Welcome, Ms. Harrison. Hi, my name is Amy Harrison and my address is 7385 Wood Springs Drive in Whitsitt. I'm a special education teacher at Rudy Fork Elementary and in my 22nd year of teaching. I would like to start out by saying thank you to the board members who have consistently voted to keep our staff and students safe by voting for a mandatory mask mandate for all staff and students. I feel safer knowing that there's a requirement for everyone. I'd also like to thank Ms. Welburn for attending Reedy Forks Hispanic Heritage Night last month. Our families and our families really enjoyed seeing you on our campus and would love to see all of you at our Trunk or Read Night on October 28th. I'm gonna be blunt with you and say I, along with the majority of my colleagues, are tired. The EC department has two new academic programs at the elementary level that I'm learning. And I'm so excited to ha actually have a math curriculum that I don't have to create by myself or piece together. Don't get me wrong, I'm excited about that. On top of learning these two, these two new programs, I continue to have to complete service delivery logs for every student and learn about, continue to learn about our progress monitoring tool that was new last year. I also have to serve as a diabetic care contact for a student who has been newly diagnosed with diabetes since our nurse is only there one time a week. If you know anything about diabetes, when a person is newly diagnosed, their blood sugar is erratic and fluctuates daily, all day long. I have to spend a significant amount of time monitoring him throughout the day. I'm not the only teacher that feels this way. I've talked with others across the district that have had students who are physically aggressive and having trouble transitioning back to in-person learning. Some have resigned and we are losing some great educators because of the stress we are under. I am pretty good at juggling all the roles that I have. Please don't add anything else to our plates. I honestly might drop them all and make a huge mess. A solution I have is to consider the importance of everything you are asking us to do. Another is to research adding counseling services for staff. I know we used to have something similar, but I'm thinking with all the budget cuts that have happened since I began working in Guilford in 2007, it was one of the things that we had to get rid of. I know you don't have control of our insurance and what they pay for, but it would also be nice to have counseling added at an affordable rate. I appreciate your time and listening ears tonight. Thank you for your service to Guilford County and its citizens. Ms. Harrison, thank you so much for your service. Layla Early. Hi, I'm Layla Early. My address is 207 West Avondale Drive in Greensboro. 
And good evening to the board and thank you for all the work that you've done to ensure our students' safety. I have children that have attended Sternberger for the past seven years and my youngest is currently a third grader at the school. As a parent, I've been an active PTA member and board member and I currently serve as one of the parent representatives on the school-based leadership team. I am happy to report that Sternberger is a wonderful example of all that a public elementary school is supposed to be. We have caring and dedicated teachers, staff and administration, enthusiastic students, and a group of parents dedicated to sustaining a strong sense of community and shared responsibility. The one thing lacking from the Sternberger experience is the shape of the school's facilities. Sternberger's reputation is such that families continue to move into our district, partly with the intention of having their children attend such a wonderful elementary school. Unfortunately, the school building was never designed to have so many students. Sternberger is one of the oldest elementary schools in Greensboro, and unfortunately, it looks like it. When the results of the facility survey were published in the News and Record, listing Sternberger as one of the few schools needing immediate attention, no one associated with the school was surprised. From our antiquated heat and air conditioning systems needing constant attention, to the concerning water leakage issues, to the increasing technology needs by our students and staff, Sternberger's facilities need immediate attention. So I come to you tonight to ask that this board approves the resolution to, for the next phase of the bond referendum financial assistance. There's only so much that our parents can do or are allowed to do. Sternberger Elementary would like to continue its tradition of excellence in a building equipped for 21st century needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Early, for your volunteer service and making time to be here. And our last speaker this evening, Michelle Fox. Make it good. We got to end on a strong note. Good evening. My name is Michelle Fox. My address is 3901 Trufford Court, Greensboro, North Carolina. I come before you today not only as a resident of Guilford County, but also the parent, a parent of two children who attend, who are currently attending Guilford County Public Schools. Not only do I have two children who are currently attending, I have two children who have also graduated from Guilford County Public Schools. And when I come to you this evening, I come to you on behalf of them um, as a community member and as a village just to say I have literally, I can say that I've literally watched the conditions of the schools crumble over the years. My children attended Irwin Montessori. And during those times, I remember walking the halls and looking up in the ceiling and seeing tiles that were broken and falling apart. Uh, walking through the hallways and seeing tiles on the floor that were cracked and broken. Um, my children actually attended um, the school during a time when, you know, they had the trailers. So it wasn't just a matter of going inside of the facility once I dropped them off, but they also went into a trailer to have their education delivered to them. However, they were exposed to the elements when they did that. And I can tell you from witnessing it firsthand, when it was cold outside, it was freezing. It was absolutely freezing in those trailers. And when it was hot outside, it was stifling on the inside. It was difficult for them to breathe. And so to ask a child to come into a classroom, into that type of environment, to give them the attention or give the teacher the attention span that they need so they can actually learn, it's difficult at best. And this is, just, this is just me speaking from what I've actually witnessed over the years. I think that it's a disservice to ask not only the children, but the teachers to come into these types of environments. The teachers come and they need to be equipped with those types of tools that allow them to be successful in what it is they're attempting to accomplish, while also giving our children the best opportunity that they absolutely have so that they can be successful. And when you're in these types of conditions and expecting our children to pay attention and learn, I think that this is just unrealistic. And so it's not just the physical conditions of the schools, it's also the techn technological advances that we're looking at. The reality of the situation is, is that when I talk to my children about who they're competing against, 
they're not competing against their peers that's sitting next to them in the classroom. They're not even competing against the, their peers in Guilford County. They're in a global market, the same way we are in our jobs every single day. These students are absolutely, with the onset of the way social media has changed the landscape of what we do in our everyday lives, these children are up against um, a competition unlike no other in their lifetime. And so I would just ask that um, as you all, as the Board of Education uh, goes forth, just know that you're on the cusp of a once in a generation opportunity. Please do your due diligence and pass that $1.7 billion bond referendum for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fox, for your patience this evening and for speaking. That concludes the public comment period, and I do want to thank all of our speakers for their patience as we worked through and for making the time to show up and advocate for kids in schools and students. We appreciate everyone who spoke this evening. Okay, at this point, can we make sure that um, Dina Hayes-Green and Kim Irby are both still with us? Can y'all hear us? So, yeah. Yes, okay. I have a substitute motion tonight. Oh. Okay, hold on once. Well, we're going... We're going for, what? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna take a breath. They're getting ahead of me, but that's okay, I'm used to that. Um, this is the point where we have approval of the agenda. Diane is moved for approval of the agenda. Second. Second, um, but Kim, I'm not sure what Kim, go ahead. Yes, I would like to offer a substitute motion tonight that we move the action items to be discussed right after the consent agenda approval. So Kim is is requesting that we amend the agenda and not not pass it as approved. Y'all can tell me what we need to do from a motion standpoint. And did you say move the action items up to just after approval of the consent agenda, so before the reports? Correct. Okay, so so is there a second for Kim's motion? So Diane has seconded that motion. So that is the motion on the floor. Is that correct, Lisa and Jill? Yeah. All right, so that was yes, a substitute motion that um, Kim has proposed that we move the action items up above reports so that we have that discussion and those action items before we move to reports. And I have Diane a has, Okay, and Diane has seconded that. Okay, is that correct? All right. Linda has a question about yes. the agenda. Do does the uh, superintendent or the well? I don't think the accountability. Does any of her comments impact that resolution? Or do you? Would there be anything? Because that's what she's asking. Okay, I'm just making sure because okay. as long as there's nothing in either one of those. I'm okay. okay. Deborah, you have a question. Just to clarify, we want to hear the policy committee report after we vote on the policy action item. Is that what we're? Yeah, because I think the report is related to other items, other policies, not the one that was out for comment. Okay. Pat, you got a question? Yeah, just so we're just moving Roman numeral eight above the consent agenda. All of those under. Cor above okay. reports and below the consent agenda. Right. After the consent agenda, above reports. Okay. All, okay. all right, so we vote. Um, you're doing Dina. Linda, will you vote aye for me on mine, please? Thank you. Now, this is Dina right here. Oh, that's Kim. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dina? Yes. Yeah. On or off? It is on. It is. She said yes. Dina did. Kim? I did. Yes. Okay, is everybody voted? Okay, so that passes eight to one. All right, so if Dr. Contreras will read the consent agenda, we will do that. Or do I, yes, you read it and then I do a motion. Is that correct? correct? Presenting the consent agenda, thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. 
This evening's consent agenda includes the approval of September 2021 meeting minute, the personnel report, the 2021-2022 lottery funds, the elementary math professional learning for 2021-2022, the class size and the class size waiver request for Guilford eLearning Virtual Academy. That concludes this evening's consent agenda for your consideration. Is there a motion? I'd like to uh, pull C. You want to pull C? Yes, ma'am. Consent agenda and have some discussion about that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we would do that after action. Well, Sorry, my mic was not on. We do that after action items if we pull that? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Winston. Anita, yes. Um, I just have a question. I don't necessarily want to pull an item. Okay. My question is on D. And there's no cost here. I just want to know what it cost. Can Dr. Oakley or you can address that? This contract um, is math professional learning for all elementary schools, not to exceed seven hundred eight thousand dollars. Seven oh eight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have pulled C to include in action items. We'll make that action item D. Move the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Deborah. All right, so we any other questions or discussion about the consent agenda? If not, we can vote. Linda, if you'll vote yes for me. Dina and Kim. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I we just on the computer up your laptop, or if you can turn your computer on. There's a slight delay, but you can watch the meeting and hear everyone's comments on the on your computer that you can't hear on the phone. So Kim, can you hear me now? Yeah, I was hearing everything fine. I don't know why it went away. Okay, <laughs> well we pulled we pulled C from the consent agenda and moved it to action items, and the rest of the consent agenda remained the same. Anita asked a clarifying question about the cost of the math professional learning, which Dr. Oakley answered with not to exceed $708,000. Okay. So Thank your you. vote on the consent agenda? Yes. And Anita, I don't think we have your vote. You don't? Okay. Um, you ready? Uh, no on B, yes on the rest. Thank you. So all but B, well, can you tell, can you announce what the vote is? I'm no good at that tabulation in my head. Yes, so thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, items A, D, and E passed unanimously. Item B passed by a vote of eight to one. Thank you very much. All right. So now we are moving to action items. Um, a is a universal face covering mass requirement, a monthly vote required by state law. Dr. Contreras, do you have any context to provide on the state mandate on this? Move the item. Your mic. I'm sorry. I'd ask legal counsel to just remind the board of the state law. So board members shall also recall, sorry, I'm double mass, so that's really not easy to hear. Um, as you'll recall, the legislature passed a requirement that boards vote at least monthly on the status of continuing mask requirements. So this would be your monthly uh, consideration. I don't believe you have any information in front of you that would change previous recommendations unless Dr. Contreras wants to add anything. So you're required to take a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane, you moved the item. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, Deborah Knapper seconded it. And just sorry, prior. but just to be clear, because it's not as clear on the agenda, what we're moving is to continue the mass requirement as it is in place at this point. Yes. You need me to say all this. <laughs> <laughs> no. Are there questions um, 
about the item? If not, then we can proceed to vote. Dina. Yes. Kim. Yes. Pat. Oh yeah. Oh, I have to vote. D yes, please, Linda. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, and that passes six to three. All right, our next item B is policy 5070-7350. It's a public records policy for retention, release, and disposition. Um, uh, policy Committee Chair Betty Jenkins, do you have a motion or a comment on this issue? I can make a motion that we adopt the policy 5070-7350, public records retention, release, and disposition as presented. Second. And as I understand it, there were no public comments. I asked this of the clerk earlier. There were no public comments um, submitted on this policy. Are there any comments or questions from members of the board? Pat? Yeah, I just had a question on the, uh, can you just highlight where the change was or if there was any revision that's as a part of this? Or is this just like a boilerplate? Yeah. I think especially as we talk about public records, as it relates to the public. That, yeah. Did you, you have know, a yeah. chance to review it when it went out for public comment or in the agenda packet? Or I did, did but I don't have my computer, so I can't really see the, the full language of it. Yeah. So. As I recall, it came from the North Carolina State yeah, Board Association. I don't know if yeah, just um, a little context, Margaret Winslow, staff person, is here. Um, I think she I recall is. from our original meeting. Okay, but it's two not a ago. new policy. Um, Board Member Tillman, what it is, is bringing it up to code um, with the federal and state guidelines. Okay, so there was no major no. shifts. Okay. No. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? So if not, we can proceed to vote. Um, Linda, I'm a yes. I'll do that first. Dina? Yes. Oh, Kim, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please. I feel like I'm in the circus. Uh, passes eight to one. All right. Uh, item C, one that we had so many comments on this evening. Resolution requesting the Guilford County Board of Commissions place a $1.7 billion school construction bond referendum on the March 2022 ballot. Um, Superintendent, would you please um, read the full resolution for the board's consideration? Move the item. Certainly. Whereas the Guilford County Board of Education believes that educating the children of Guilford County is critical and essential to all citizens of Guilford County. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education believes that all children deserve to attend school in a permanent building capable of supporting the educational programs and services that contribute to a sound education. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education believes that no child should be disadvantaged by inadequate facilities or lack of proper instructional equipment. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education and the Guilford County Board of Education established a joint capitals facilities planning committee and commissioned an assessment of all school and district buildings that determined that significant school facilities and equipment need, ex, needs exist to a, adequately meet the demands of our student population. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education has subsequently developed a long range master facilities plan to achieve the goals set for students by the Board of Education. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the Guilford County Board of Education request that the Guilford County Board of Commissioners place a school construction bond referendum in the amount of $1.7 billion. Please see the attached Guilford County Schools Facilities Master Plan on the March 2022 election ballot for approval by the voters of Guilford County. Madam it's the Vice 19th Chair. day of October, 2021. Madam Vice Chair. Yes, one moment. Um, board Member Bellamy Small moved the item. Is there a second? Second. Uh, board Member Jenkins. 
apologize. Uh, Diane moved the item. Board member Jenkins seconded it. Questions and comments, Anita Sharp. Well, I think it's got, it has an error in it. Um, Say I'm that not, again, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. I think it has an error in, in the it. resolution. Yes, Okay. on the fourth whereas, mm -hmm. read that again. Whereas the Guilford County Board of Education and the Guilford County Board of, oh. <laughs> well, the Guilford County Board of Education and the Guilford County Board of County Commissioners. Thank you. Yes, correction yes. in that second. Thank you so much. There's a typo. Move the item with that correction. Is that? Yeah, move the item you know, with any needed corrections. Second. Are there comments and questions? Mr. Tillman. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to support this bond and um, you know I've been consistent on that but but I do think it it's important for the public to know a little bit of context and I'm not gonna take us too far back in history um, but just to think about our school system and this type of money and, and the amount because it is it is huge um, for a county our size um, and, and no one would would deny that um, but in 2000 there was a bond referendum one um, on the ballot uh, for 3.1 billion for our North Carolina universities and community colleges. Now that number would be almost 5.6 billion today. And if you ride around Chapel Hill or East Carolina or Appalachian, as I did on college tours, it's like a constant construction zone. So somehow we have money and we find money for those for higher education, but yet, and still we somehow uh, through no fault uh, of our own, uh, we find ourselves in this situation. And, and let it be known, this board did not put us in this position. Um, let's don't go there. Um, but we can get out of it. We can help get us out of it. Um, and as we've talked about uh, the master facilities plan, this was, we all went into this eyes wide open uh, in partnership with, with elected officials and business leaders. Um, it was a third party objective data that we received back. Um, it wasn't a pet project or any type of uh, thing like that. Um, so I think it's important to underscore that. And, it, and I'm going to support this. Um, but I do want us as a community, as a board, to be mindful that the work we've been doing with lawmakers in Raleigh on the quarter cent sales tax is critical. We and, and I'll say it again to those senators <laughs> listening um, that have uh, can have control and say over that, we need that quarter cent sales tax uh, to help pay down this debt. I think the numbers, um, Ms. Henry, are somewhere between 30 and 35 million if we can get that language to authorize a quarter cent sales tax on the ballot. And that's the difference. It's not just a quarter cent sales tax that can be used for anything it's specifically for education so i just want everybody to keep that in mind um because you know economies rise and fall um it is a large number um i think we certainly have the backing of of this community and the business community to do so but that quarter cent sales tax is, is very important so i just wanted to that financing element i did want to mention but you know to folks that are in the northwest area you know when I got elected, I walked through and all the trailers and the overcrowding, this solves that. Um, we heard from other schools in all of our districts that have the same thing. And I've been to the Middle East and I've been in third world schools and, and I certainly am not comparing the two, but we certainly have buildings that would fall into that type of uh, category. So I'm, I'm gonna support it. Um, I had a lot more to say, but I'll just keep it brief. Um, just for us to be mindful and judicious during this entire process and to really, I'd implore all of us to reach out to your legislators and, and share why the quarter cent sales tax language for us is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Bellamy Small and then Board Member Welburn. It's not that I'm opposed to us having the quarter cents, but these are our kids. Guilford County is not a poor county. And when businesses keep saying to public education, educate our workforce, then I feel like it's important for them to invest because for every million they spend helping us, they're going to make 10. 
or more. So it is also in, incumbent upon the business community in Guilford County to step up and be willing to pay property tax or um, fee taxes or whatever to help us with this, to solely rely on whether we pass a quarter cent tax is not where it is. These are our kids. These are the kids who we want to be in the hospitals, in the schools, in the businesses. And the, even during the pandemic, other than um, in the um, uh, service industry like restaurants and those types of things, you have not heard of a lot of major businesses that are in Guilford County shutting down. They may have had to lay people off for a little while or have people work from home, but you have not heard any business putting off three, four, or a thousand people. So that means they're still employed, they're still in business, they're still making money. So, you know, I, I want this thing to be supported, but I really want our community, our business community, who is making money. And for those of you, particularly if you go into the northwest section of Guilford County, there's a boom town. Ever since we put uh, 73 and 74, uh, 220 going north, that area is exploding in development, both as far as housing, businesses, and corporations, because they're coming near the airport. I suggest that folks look at the airport's 25-year uh, plan. We're going to have even more businesses because Greensboro Guilford County has been strategically placed to be a logistics hub in North Carolina. So all I'm saying is look at where all the dollars can come from. We could afford, we could have afforded to put this bond on the ballot last time. So there's really no reason for it not to be put on the ballot this time and have strong support from our corporate community. Thank you. Um, Board Member Wellborn. I just heard that. Can you turn your mic on? Um, Sorry. You know, I just heard that no business is closed. Smith Street Diner, a, um, you know, staple in the... I didn't say, I, I said that restaurants and small businesses, I'm talking about... Okay, if we can continue with comments, we have a full agenda and need to hear about our academic outcomes. Uh, so no, go ahead. Thank you. So I am also saying there's a lot of property owners out there that didn't get rent for an extended period of time that are trying to recover. Some of them have lost their uh, properties due to foreclosure. Um, to, and we're in a high rate of inflation at this time. To put this huge of a burden on business, especially it's not just big businesses, folks. It's small businesses. It's the little guy, okay? So to put this kind of property value, because um, that's what's going to support it. And I know a lot of people that used uh, rental properties as their investment um, for their retirement for this. Well, when no one was paying rent due to the COVID situation, they got hurt. So I'm like, this, you know, I think is too big of an ask. I think it would take us 20 years to even spend this money and um so i'm not going to vote for it thank you other comments or questions uh miss sharp miss sharp and then miss napper my first question is how far down the list is this going to get us i'm sorry this would get us down to the allen j school in high point Um, what number is that on here? Hold on one moment. That's what I had marked. I had marked 50. That's 50. line 58 okay. and includes 19 rebuilds, 12 full renovations, three new constructions, five priority repairs, both transportation hubs, and deferred maintenance for 363 million in deferred maintenance for all schools, 
the safety upgrades for all schools and technology for all schools. So that would get us as far as line 58 if our inflation number is correct. Correct. And the, if you go to line 40 mm -hmm. and also to line 52, mm -hmm. it includes $363.4 million in deferred maintenance safety upgrades and technology for all other schools on the list. So it's not just the 41 projects that I indicated up to line 58. It includes deferred maintenance, safety upgrades and technology for all other schools. Okay, uh, can Ms. Knapper ask her question while I do a little look in four minutes? Sure, go ahead. So, um, sorry, y'all, I'm back and I've got full lung capacity and visual aids. <laughs> so something I've seen going a lot on social media has been the question, you now have $300 million, what have you done with it? Um, first up, let's understand exactly what that $300 million does for us. So, somewhere along the lines of this, and I swear I'll keep it short, um, we have asked for $2 billion, and yeah, we need a few more zeros, but it is what it is, to fix these schools. Last year, the prior board put that up for a vote to send to the county commissioners. The county commissioners, prior commissioners, came back and said, there you go, fix it. Okay, 20%. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of what we asked for was actually put on the ballot. If you would like to know why we are behind on the security systems, if you would like to know why the HVA systems have not been repaired, and all of these things that have hit us this year have come at us, it is because we are doing 20% 20, 20 of repairs. That's not sustainable. And as Pat mentioned earlier, this has been going on for decades. Many people who spoke at this podium earlier mentioned this has been going on for decades. We need these repairs. We got this. So what we're trying to do here is Take the 300 million we've got. If you would like to know what is going on with that 300 million, I would encourage you to go back and watch the work session that we did over the summer. Of course, email us with questions, please do. And add back this. There's your HVAC. There's your updated security. Please help us. As Pat mentioned, we definitely, I do believe in the um, quarter, quarter, percent, uh, quarter cent sales tax increase. My, and Ms. Diane Bellamy Small had a fantastic point about businesses and investing in the future here. Please help us. Board Member Sharp. Yeah, if I'm, I'm had to read this very quickly, uh, but I believe it shows 1.119 million for deferred maintenance technology in safe schools. Is there another line item I'm missing? Line 40 and line that 52. Is, all right, that is 40. Line 52. 52, yes. Thank you. Um, I will have to agree with Linda. I mean, I've been around here for a long time. I've been in a lot of schools. The needs are there. The needs are real. Um, but businesses are beginning to feel the effects of the inflation. Um, Construction is slowing down. Construction products are getting harder to get at a higher price. Uh, I have my doubts as to whether we can complete what we planned with the 300 million because of the price increases. And I, I'm just, I know there's, you know, we need, we need work done. I know that, no doubt about it. I just question that the amount is more then we will be able to get past. And if it fails, it's going to be a long time before we get another one. Um, I just think maybe we go for another 20%. That's 40% and just keep chipping away at it piece by piece or maybe go for 30% to get us up to 50%. Um, I just think the when you put a B after it, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna scare people away. Board Member Jenkins. Well, instead of having 1.7 billion, we can really use 2.7 billion. So I will support the 1.7. Not only that, I will support the 
quarter cent sales tax, almost every person that came out to speak tonight talked about leaky roof, the, the, the floors, the holes in the, in the ceiling, all those things, the heat, the air conditioning. We can't continue to put our teachers, our staff, and our students in a situation like this. So I support the 1.7 along with the quarter cent sales tax. Thank you. Thank you. The other comments and questions before we move to vote? The motion was moved, I believe, by Diane Bellamy Small and seconded by Betty Jenkins or Deborah Knapper? Who? Jenkins. Betty Jenkins. Okay. So we can vote. Linda, you can do mine as an aye, please. Dina? Yes. And Kim? Yes. So it passes a vote of seven to two. Okay, next item on the agenda was pulled from the consent agenda, 2021-2022 uh, lottery funds. Uh, it's a recommendation that the board approve the application for the release of 4.75 um, million from the public school building capital fund, North Carolina education lottery distributions for the 2021-22 school bond referendum debt service expense. I know this is something that we do annually. Um, Board Member Valmy Small, you pulled that from the consent agenda. Do you have a question or context you'd like requested before we open it for discussion? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I am not supporting this, and my reason is because the lottery funds, unless I've you know, been misled for the last, when did this pass? 2006. 2006? Mm -hmm. Was supposed to come to the schools. And... Um, and um, Angie Henry and I have done the research and, you know, pull articles and everything. And the last count, I think there may be three school, three states that really use the, their lottery money directly to the schools. Um, we should be getting this money, which would help with the deferred maintenance. Plus, if we limp along with the bond, this is 2021. We're going to be in 2050 before we finish these schools. That's ridiculous. Most of us won't even be here. Our great-grandchildren won't be here. So my, my reason for pulling was simply to express that I think that we should at least ask the county commissioners to give us a portion. Because if you've been paying down a debt since 2010. 2008 is when. Um, okay. we, we've been paying down this debt for however many years that, that is, uh, 12 years. We, there should be some portion of that that we should be able to get out of this $4,750. Uh, $4, I've proposed it before. I just feel like that there should at least be an ask for us to get 20% of this money. If it, if it, would, it, would, it would help fix, it's not gonna fix Alan J because if the floor is sinking, that's a whole rebuild, but it might help us instead of us having to keep asking for some of the maintenance money that we've not gotten. So, you know, unless somebody else, I mean, I'll move it now, but I'm not gonna vote for it. Or if somebody, if that's not appropriate, somebody else can move it, so. Are there other comments or questions? But yeah, Board Member Sharp. What's our outstanding bond debt? So um, the county hasn't issued their CAFR for June 30th, 2021 yet, but their outstanding uh, bonds payable at June 30th, 2020 was $693.8 million. That's not all related to schools. They don't have it that was out that way. question, right? Yeah, how much of that is ours? Yeah. We don't know. Are there other comments or questions from board members? They're probably still paying them to jail. Are there other comments yes. from board members? Linda, thank you. Um, well, how do we know that we're paying off school debt and not other bond debt? Would be so, my question. Yeah, so um, in their budget for the 2022 school year, the, the county does break out the debt service, how much they're paying in principal and interest by purpose. And so when you look at that, uh, at the total $93.2 million that they're gonna pay in debt service, which is again, the principal and interest for this year, um, 68.5 million of that is for Guilford County Schools debt. So they've broken, they've broken out the debt service. I just can't find the amount of the bonds that are specific to um, Guilford County Schools. 
And what was that debt service figure? 68.5 is related to Guilford County Schools. 93.2 is the total. I, I, go ahead. I would just think there would be a better way for us, you know, when you have a mortgage on your house, you know exactly how much you exactly. owe. And so, you know, when we continue to pay this, I'm like, you know, I don't feel comfortable. I can, I can go to my mortgage company and say, what's the payout? Can we do that? Oh, I, I could ask them, but they, the way these bonds work, they, you know, they issue the bonds and then they issue, they do refunding and they do all kinds of things that I don't know if they track it, you know, how much they do by school once they issue just a general obligation bond. Um, I can, I can ask them if that's, you know, what the, if that's the case, but again, their total debt at June 30th, 2020 for uh, their total bonds payable was 693 point, um, about $8 million. I want to ask one more question. Do we know, is there ever a point, if we continue paying this for another 10 years and took no more bonds out, would we ever know whether we got it totally paid for? So yeah, they amortize their bonds usually every 20 years. So the last, the last, um, bond well the last time voters approved bonds for Guilford County Schools was in uh, 2008 but that doesn't mean that's when well, the 20, county 2020 sold. 300 million oh, I'm sorry okay. <laughs> but that but those haven't been issued yet I do know that those haven't been sold yet so I don't know when the last sale of the 2008 approved bonds were but from what, what that date is forward 20 years is, is what their um, expected okay. payoff time is I'm going to say one more thing. In the okay. I mean, we have a long agenda tonight with academic outcomes for students. So I would like us to move through this and move take a vote. So Betty's moved the item. Pat hasn't spoken yet. So Pat, go ahead. Yeah. Just back to the, um, so, so the, just the, when, when is the issuance of the 300 million from 2020? So that'll be when, when the, when we start, uh, well, the County decides how they want to fund us. I mean, they've approved the project ordinances and you know they can get cash in multiple multiple different ways to fund our expenses what we've spent to date um you know in, in prior uh, bond issuances sometimes they've they've done a lot of credit until we get to a certain amount and then they'll issue debt uh, to try to minimize the issuance cost um, and try to take advantage of the interest rates you know when they drop so they they work very hard to to do it when it's most advantageous for the citizens of Gopher county um, and when they need the cash, right? So, right. Yeah, board members, remember that just because a bond referendum passes doesn't mean they're obligated to issue all those bonds. It is an available source of funds for them. But they Thank you, Jill. Linda, do you have one final question? Well, I was just going to make the point that what we need to go after is the state to get more lottery money. I mean, because that's what it was for, okay? I mean, the fact that we are getting shortchanged I mean, the where we're really getting shortchanged is at the state level on lottery that they sold this as building schools. So I'm just going to say we can point our finger at the county commissioners, but where we're really getting shortchanged is when the lottery was initially advertised as being able, going to be utilized, and we're getting a small, very small percentage of that massive amount of money, and it really doesn't impact drastically helping us rebuild our schools. That Thank would be you. my point. Board member Jenkins moved the item. Is there a second? Second. Kim Irby seconded it so we can vote. Linda, I'm an I. Well, what is, oh. We're voting to move. Uh, go ahead and. Item C as written on as the written. consent That's agenda. What I need to know. Yep. And you are? Yes. Dana? Yeah. Kim? Yes. Is that everybody? Oh, it's up there. I'm sorry. Um, it passes uh, eight to one. Yes. Okay. All right. So that bring that takes us through our action items. We have several other things on the agenda this evening. I, for one, need a bathroom break. Um, so we could do closed session and bathroom breaks and then come back for the academic reports. Dr. Contreras, does that work for you? You're the, um, and Dr. Oakley. Um, everybody got to come back because we're talking about student outcomes. We're talking about academics. This is the core of what we're about. 
So, um, Anita, do you have a motion for closed session? I do. I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to discuss confidential safety and security measures. Is there a second? Second. Betty Jenkins seconded. So do we need to vote? All those raise your hand, stand to go into closed session. Um, Kim and Dina, you have to be present for closed session. So we'll, Lisa, you'll be in touch with them about how to get them back on board for the accountability. Did y'all hear that, Dina and Kim? And I'll just stay here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Fast bathroom break.
Uh, we got a quorum back in open session. Do we have Dina and Kim with us just to confirm who's Dina and Kim? Are you with us? Yes, we. Are. I am. Dean Kim is too. Kim, are you with us? We're just curious as to who's here. Maybe not. I got Dina confirmed. All right. Um. I am going to forego comments from the chair and move straight to the superintendent's report, comments from the superintendent and our state accountability report. She thought I was going to make comments. I'm putting her on. <laughs> She's got to pull up her notebook. Thank you. And good evening again. Congratulations to Katrinka Brown, principal at Jackson Middle, and Leah Carper, English teacher at Northern High, who were announced as principal and teacher of the year at Celebration of Excellence last month. They are just two examples of the amazing educators in our district, and we are rooting for them as they move to the regional and state levels of these competitions. I'd also like to congratulate Brown Summit Middle which was recently named as the top middle school and top magnet middle school in the state by U.S. News and World Report. The Academy at Lincoln was also listed as the number two elementary school in North Carolina and the state's top ranked magnet elementary school. Several other GCS schools were listed in the top 50 in the state, including Cronodal Middle at number 46, Northern Elementary also at number 46, and Oak Ridge Elementary at number 49. High school rankings will be released in the spring. Our 15 comprehensive high schools this week relaunched and updated their learning hubs now in an after-school format. Students have been identified based on risk factors for not graduating on time, and nearly 1,700 students have registered to participate. The learning hubs will include accelerated learning and tutoring, as well as enrichment opportunities and social emotional learning activities. Participation is free thanks to a grant, thanks to grant funding from the Walton Family Foundation and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. We hope to lead the nation with this new model of learning recovery. October is National Principals Month. And I want to express my appreciation for all of our outstanding principals and assistant principals who work incredibly hard to support our students, staff members, and parents throughout the year. Please be sure to let your children's principal know how much you appreciate them. I promise you it would mean the world to our principals. Finally tonight, I want to congratulate our board chair, Dina Hayes, for being named a finalist for the Green Garner Award from the Council of the Great City Schools. The Green Garner Award recognizes outstanding contributions to urban education. The winner will be announced on Thursday during the Council of the Great City Schools virtual fall conference and is the highest honor in urban education. This concludes my remarks. And I will move to the state accountability data reporting. And I introduce to you again, Dr. Sonia Stevens, our chief performance officer, and Dr. Whitney Oakley, our deputy superintendent, who will be presenting uh, a summary of the state accountability report. You all have a much longer report in front of you. It does not reflect the PowerPoint, which it has fewer slides, but you have a more detailed report. And you can certainly contact um, either Dr. Oakley or preferably Dr. Stevens, uh, who can answer any of your questions about the more detailed report. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. And good evening, members of the board. Oh, should I go ahead? Um, this evening, we will provide a summary of the accountability re results from the 2021 school year. While reviewing the results, our uh, DPI recommends not making comparison to the 2018-19 school year because of the various circumstances that occurred during 2021. However, we can use the 2021 data to, um, as a reference point. 
Overall, we saw large declines in all of the tested areas across grade spans. Gaps persist by race and student groups. We also saw larger declines, uh, let me catch up. Um, we also saw larger declines in math than in reading and science. Make it short, okay. Um, is that the right? Yes. Um, the U.S. Department of Education advises that these data are not valid for making um, accountability decisions, but should be used to make student-centered decisions around future planning and resources and next steps. As a reminder, students did not test in the 2019-20 school year. So the data for, uh, for, those, for that year is not included in the results. The deadline for students, um, as an update, the deadline for students to graduate and count in the 2021 school year was extended from July 15th to August 6th. And this year um, was the, is the second year that scores were not included in the high school math one results. Also, 2021 was the second year for the Math 3 um, end of course assessment. Let me just jump in real quick. Um, when, when you think about bank scores, I just wanted to remind the board that the middle school sc students who took high school math, their scores used to count in the high school scores, and that is no longer the case. So we see big dips um, because of that, in addition to the learning loss. Um, so just a reminder that those scores used to be there, and now they're not. So it's not comparing the same thing. Go ahead. Thank you. The class of 2021 marked the highest graduation rate in history for Guilford County Schools at 91.5. Our rate was higher than all of the large districts in North Carolina. We had 12 schools to graduate 100% of our students and of their students and 78% of GCS schools had a rate of 90% or higher. Our graduation gap among racial groups was reduced by 7.2% over the past 10 years. Here's the list of the schools that graduated 100% of their students and a list of the schools that had a graduation rate of 90% or higher. We continue to show improvements with graduating all of our racial groups. We are also improving our rates for economically disadvantaged English language students and students with disabilities. I think it's important to note here um, that the increase in graduation rate, given the unique year that we had, didn't happen by chance. Lots of people worked really hard and did some innovative things to make that happen. The board will remember the launch of the learning hubs. Those started out on weekends and went to weeknights. Um, they included meals and transportation. We were able to have flexible schedule for high school students who during the pandemic had taken on jobs or were caring for younger siblings who were learning remotely. We had boots on the ground, attendance recovery efforts, principals, teachers, counselors went door to door literally to find kids who weren't signing on. Um, to remote learning and getting them into the school building. We also implemented the fifth quarter when we tacked on that additional time to the end of the school year for students in middle and high school who were failing a course to have the opportunity to improve to a passing grade and added counselors to schools that had seen who saw the highest numbers of students who were possibly not graduating. So I, I don't want us to say that it was just left to chance or because of a longer window. There were lots of intentional efforts that took lots of resources, lots of manpower, lots of fiscal resources that will need to continue if we're going to be able to maintain these graduation rates. When we look at overall grade level performance composite, I think this is an important time to think about um, how we're going to have to set new baselines. Um, we had just sent, we had just revised our key performance indicators five weeks before schools shut down um, during the pandemic. So we had just voted and agreed on new KPIs. Five weeks later, school closed. Two disrupted years later, we're going to have to set new baseline. It'll align with new strategic planning, um, but this is going to paint the picture of kind of our, our new starting point. Um, compared to other large districts, though, when we look at declines in performance, um, we were only we were just below, we were better than the state average and only second in the loss um, captured in overall performance composite. 
Um, when we take a look at EOG scores, as a reminder, these are a reference point not to be used for comparison. The 2020 year is missing, but you can see declines across all um, racial ethnic groups and across our English learners and our students with disabilities. We know from the data across the nation, but also within um, Guilford, that students with disabilities, English learners, and students taking math classes suffered the most um, during, during remote learning. Math is um, an even more bleak picture, and this also lines up with the data from across the country. Um, we saw gaps, um, de declines in the 20s and 30s um, when we look across grade levels. This captures third through eighth grade um, with a 37.5 um, overall proficiency in math. Um, the next slide looks at uh, racial group and the declines in math, and you can see similar um, trends here across racial groups with our black and our Hispanic students suffering the most learning loss in math. We know this has um, deep meaning for later life outcomes. This board has talked a lot about the importance of when students take and pass Math 1, and so we'll need to think about where they're starting um, after this 2021 school year. Math proficiency here across English learners and non-English learners and students with disabilities and non-students with disabilities, only 7.2 of our black students with disabilities showed proficiency in math. When we look at science, um, science scores did not decrease to the extent that math scores did, but they did increase um, for every group across both fifth and eighth grade when that science test is given. The next slide shows the racial um, ethnic groups and the declines for each are captured there. Again, our white and Asian students for, um, had less declines than our other student groups. End of course grade level proficiency is captured on this slide for all end of course tests. Um, a reminder about those bank scores, that math one number is startling. Um, when we look at single digits showing math proficiency, I think you've heard us talk a lot about our tutoring efforts and how we've started with secondary math, and this is part of the reason why. Um, the math three test, this is the second year we've given that test. Um, and then, of course, biology and the, the, the lowest declines were given and um, were shown in our reading and our English, too. And that's just the nature of the standards and how reading is taught compared to math. Other performance indicators, when we look at our, um, our district in comparison to the other large six districts in the state of North Carolina, this slide shows the percent of 11th grade students who met that ACT composite of 17, which is actually a pretty low bar. Um, this points the need um, to make sure our students are prepared to take and pass um, the ACT and why we're making sure that that's part of our post-secondary success plan um, with our ESSER funds. Also, the ACT work keys is shown here with a 66% of our students scoring at the silver level or higher on that ACT work keys test in comparison to the state average of 63.3, but much lower than um, Wake, who is near 80%. Um, 80 I will say we did have higher participation rates in most of these tests in some of our neighboring districts, and so we've taken that into account as we've looked at this data. Our English learners meeting exit criteria on the access test was only 7.9 compared to the state average of 9.2, which is part of the reason we're targeting many recovering efforts on our English learners, who again we know had a, a difficult time accessing learning remotely. We know there's ongoing challenges. We know that there's a long runway ahead. We also know that students testing in 2021 were about 10 points behind in math and nine points behind in reading compared with their match students in previous years, and that students of color fared the worst during the period of remote learning. That's captured here and just an example of elementary math, but it's true across grade spans and across subject areas. Here in Guilford, um, we have increased levels of poverty. We know there's a strong correlation between poverty and academic performance. Our hyper-segregated areas of po um, poverty in the community have students who are facing more inequities prior to the pandemic and will therefore take the longest to recover. 
the pandemic also saw, um, and a, a principal talked about it tonight, an increase in student mobility when students are shifting from school to school. That negatively impacts learning um, ob for obvious reasons. Um, and then remote learning disproportionately impacted our English learners, our students with disabilities. Um, we also continue to face higher numbers of teachers who are in their first year, their second year, their third year. Imagine your first year in the classroom being remote or your whole student teaching experience being through Microsoft Teams. Um, so the, the need to invest in professional learning, the need to recognize the number of new and lateral entry teachers we have is going to be with us for some time. When we look at learning loss recovery efforts, um, we have done some things and early on did some things um, under the leadership of the superintendent who charged us very quickly after school closure to establish a tutoring core and to make sure we had tutors in place. Um, but the, the research is telling us that in order to address declines in proficiency, there's three things that work. Um, expanding learning time. We did that this year with our restart schools, our 24 lowest performing schools, by adding on some time. But we're going to have to continue to look at ways we can do that. High intensity tutoring is the second, making sure that we are able to provide time during the day with trained tutors, not homework help, but help to, for students to fill in the skill gaps is really important. Um, and then the last one is acceleration, not remediation. We want to make sure that students continue to have access to grade level content and that we just don't revert back to, oh, I have to teach what they were supposed to get last year and then we'll get to this year. We have to make sure that we're giving access to grade level um, content to accelerate learning and not fall into a remedial mindset. So that's what our professional learning um, has and will continue to focus on. There are some bright spots. We, talk, we have to think very carefully about all the work that went into the highest graduation rate in history for all student groups at 91.5%. It's higher than all the other large districts. Um, and we had an increase, again, in the graduation rates for all student groups and racial ethnic groups. It's also higher than the state average. We know that um, the decisions made by this board to return to in-person learning sooner made a difference. When we look at ourselves across other districts who stayed remote for longer or only came for one week and then went home for two weeks, you can tell that bringing our youngest and our most vulnerable students back five days a week did make a difference. We did have higher assist assessment participation rates, lower declines in proficiency than the state average, the second lowest decline of the six largest districts. More than half of our students remained proficient in fifth grade science, eighth grade science, and English too. And we did have an increase in the percentage of our students who scored silver or higher on the ACT work keys. While we know that we have these highlights ahead of us, we also know that we have to establish new baselines and new goals based on where we are. I think, um, you know, as we move forward, we have to think about um, the context that we're in and how we're making um, decisions moving forward. We had um, a couple of speakers tonight say um, that the superintendent, the district should be held accountable for decreased student results when we had two disrupted years um, and that every state in the district and the whole United States went down. Our data looks like everyone else's. We saw smaller decreases than the comparable districts across the state. Um, but our data show that we will see and feel the impact of this and the impact of two disrupted years of, of learning and that it could take up to 50 years. It's a generation of recovery. It's not something that a summer school is going to fix or one intervention is going to fix. Um, and so I think that this connects directly to economic development. There's lots of data out there that talks about a huge impact to our gross domestic product following the pandemic. And so I think the impacts are widespread. Um, but I think that we have to use the data that we have to make individual learning plans and not compare it to 2019, which is the last data set we have. So um, I think we use this as a starting place to move forward. Um, and at this point, we're happy to answer any questions that you have about the data that was shared. Thank you, Dr. Oakley and Dr. Stevens. And thank you so much for all the work that you do to gather the data and make it digestible, available to the public, to us. We, we really appreciate that. Um, questions and comments, Diane? Okay, first. How is the um, rate of return 
uh, impacting, or, or do, you, do you even know uh, in terms of, okay, we're not, if we were supposed to have seven, 74,000 students, but we only have, what, 68,000? I mean, we don't have all of the kids. They, all the kids can come back when we open school back. Are but you talking them, about last year? I'm talking about for this year. For or this year, you're talking about declines in enrollment for this year? Yeah, but but but, but students are dribbling in, right? I mean, they're, they didn't all start on day one. Is that impacting us at all? So that if you had a, a kid who, um, the last time he was in school, he was a kindergartner. Now he's supposed to be what, second grade? That's right. Okay, but he didn't come, he or she didn't come back on August the 24th. But you, know, you understand what I'm trying to ask you is, is, is that impacting us? Because then when that child does come in, all the other kids have already been in school for two months. Yeah, it, any absence negatively impacts academic performance. I don't know that we have individual student data that says it's worse now after two years. I think we could draw some inferences from that. But certainly any time that students miss you know, consecutive days of school, there's going to be impacts on their learning. Okay. You did have some data. You may recall, um, Mrs. Bellamy Small, that when we first did the NWEA MAP test, the students who had been in school for five weeks outperformed the students who were out of school. So us getting students back in school earlier mattered. And any attendance difference ha does matter. So you're right on track. Okay. Then my next question has to do with uh, page seven. Um, <clears throat> first, do you know why you had such a hot, like that 100% looks really good? What, what's the difference or what did we do or what did the school do that made that happen? I mean, if you can tell me shortly, not. Is there an answer? For the graduation rate? Yeah, I mean. Well, I, in, in these schools, they can select their students. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I just wanted to, to have some idea as to... I mean, I just want to be honest about that. They select the students, and every one of the 100% stu uh, schools, those are magnets. All right. All right. And then um, right. For, for, this, for the same page. Okay. Well, well, I just wanted to know, you know, did we just, you know, did we find some goal or something as to why did that happen like that? I mean... Not that I'm, I mean, I think the 90% is still good, but I just wanted a, a why for that. And then do you have any way of knowing uh, how many kids after graduation continued uh, with higher education or what percentage, particularly since uh, your community colleges were offering free uh, enrollment, weren't, weren't they, for last year for kids once they finished high school, am I correct? Are you talking about college and career promise? Yeah, just how many kids have gone, or do we know how many kids that graduated in this class, in these class, went yeah. on to higher education? We do have that report, and we've shared with you all that the, at the national level, thirteen there's a decrease by thirteen point one percent. We see decreases here. Um, that's one of the reason we keep talking about the FAFSA. Uh, the more you can get students to complete the FAFSA, the more likely they are to enroll. Um, there's also uh, a national uh, report that fewer boys are going to school and that college enrollment uh, is up to 70% female now, which is going to cause a national crisis for us. So we have been going to the policy committee trying to see if we can make as uh, as part of a graduation requirement completion of the FAFSA uh, so that um, we can get more students into at least two-year training uh, because fewer students, even with the free programs, are going into uh, community college or four-year college. Okay. And then my last question has to do with page 23. Um, 
do we know why black children are on the aren't they the light blue mm -hmm. okay do we know why that is and yeah. and do we know what we can do yeah. to change that outcome black students were the least likely to go back to school well, I mean, that's why I wanted to ask because, you know, we, we shouldn't be coming in last. In right. The they were the least time. likely in uh, the nation to go back to school during the pandemic. Okay. So, but now that they're back in school, that's the second part of my question. Yeah, we'll what? have to catch them up. But you asked the question about why the data looks yes. the way it does. Yes. Yeah. But the, the second part of my question was, uh, what else can we do? And I guess that's all of the other interventions that you, you're putting in place. Mm -hmm. It is. And I mean, I think... Um, Science is as a hands-on, it doesn't matter what level of science, if it's biology, chemistry, physics, um, you know, it's, it's going to take some time to recover um, a whole two years worth of, of lost time with science. But the blue line, you know, we've, we've talked about this for quite some time about the gaps persisting in performance even prior to the pandemic. And so, um, you know, this is, it's a long runway ahead, but now the starting point is even lower than it was before. Okay, so then, Dr. Contreras, as the uh, consummate professional that you are, will black and brown children ever be at a point, in your opinion, that they'll catch up or that they'll, you know, not be the last ones on the lungs? Well, I think uh, catching up is more than addressing uh, educational issues. So I think it's going to require addressing um, factors in uh, transportation, unemployment, um, criminal justice, all of the other issues. Like uh, the educational system cannot alone close the achievement gap when there are so many um, inequities in every other American system. So we have to do our part and make sure that we provide black and brown students and all students, but certainly black and brown students who tend to be congregated um, together in high poverty schools with high quality teachers. They tend to have the youngest teachers, teachers with the least experience. Um, they tend to have the most teacher mobility. They themselves have the most mobility. Um, we have to try to stabilize the school setting and provide them with great instruction. Um, but in addition to that, all of the other uh, systems have to uh, improve if we want to see improvement in academic outcomes, which are tied to social, um, socioeconomic status. And this final question, you may not be able to answer tonight. I just wonder how are our kindergarten students, the kids who were in kin who are, should now be second graders, so they did miss kindergarten first grade, right? Do you know how they are doing, or is that something we won't know until next semester? So um, for those groups of students, so think about them. They were in kindergarten in March of 2020 and went home in March and then, you know, came back in the October 5th of their first grade year. So if you think about the months of, that were missed for that group of students, um, that group of students is the one, are the best data set we'll have for them are the, the, the Dibbles, the dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills and the NWEA map data. So we um, will look from, they took a false assessment in reading and math, they'll have a winter touch point, and then they'll have an end of year um, spring, a spring data. So we'll be able to share more once we have those three data points. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments, Pat? Yes, thank you for all the data and moving through it expeditiously. I was, <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I just had a question on page 46 when I look at the uh, 11th grade uh, ACT, um, you know, students have met the minimum. And as I was going through the different, looking at the different slides, you know, there are some areas where we have kind of outpaced um, our neighboring counties in terms of scores and graduation rates. But then th this one's just, to me, it kind of jumps out. Um, I'm not sure what the, 
relationship there is <clears throat> in, in terms of how, and maybe we can, you can get back to me on that. Um, in terms of the relationship between where in some areas we've outpaced our neighboring counties, um, but then on page 46, the, or my page 46, the 11th grade um, ACT uh, proficiency. proficiency score, how we went down compared to our, again, our neighboring counties. Yeah. Yeah, I think without a, a full evaluation, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to know. I think we had a lot of um, high school students change their plans. I think that's connected to freshman enrollment. Um, we're continuing. We've ramped up our ACT prep and the FAFSA completion in hopes that this this planning for post-secondary success is something that we're, we're holding true to. I think um, the focus groups with students um, will also, you know, help provide additional information. It's why the learning hubs are important so that we can do that ACT prep work. Um, we don't have a standalone root cause. We also know that high school students were less likely to return than any other student group. Um, when we look across grade span. So I think that we can throw all those theories out there, um, but it's definitely something that we're committed to looking at. Yeah. And that, in, that in concert with the poverty rate is increasing at the high school levels. Mm -hmm. So as poverty increases, and you all may recall our board chair's groundwater study, that academic outcomes are tied to the socioeconomic status of the parents. So the poverty rate, um, you see it rising. I remember when I first got here, the poverty was congregated primarily at elementary level and starting to increase at middle school. It's now gone up to the high school. Those students are now in high school and the poverty is increasing in the county. So mm -hmm. this is not uh, strange to me, especially since we're also seeing at the same time an increase and lateral entry teachers struggling to find certified math teachers, certified science teachers. Uh, all of that together is a perfect storm uh, for students not uh, excelling on ACT tests. Yeah, it just kind of jumped over the page because I'm sure there's poverty in Cumberland County and Forsyth and Wake and Charlotte too. Anyway, but I mean, I'm not, it's not an indictment. It's just, right. just an observation I mean, I, that... I think it's good to dig deeper into that because yeah. the trajectory is true. Like five to eight years ago, the demographics of our kindergartners looked very different than our high school mm -hmm. students. So it would be interesting to look. I mean, the opposites happened in Wake. That county has yeah. gotten richer. So we've gotten poorer. And so I, th I think it would be interesting to maybe look at our ACT scores in previous years mm -hmm. compared. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's troubling to see that number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But demographics play a role in it, which we've got yeah. to It is. Understand. And when we looked at the spring, when we looked at who was teaching in this, just this past spring in 612 math, only 42% of the teachers who were teaching math in secondary 612 had a math degree, to the, to the superintendent's point. Yeah. And right. And you may recall that Dr. Sarfa, when she was here, she went through detailed census tract data with us and pointed out that Black students don't just live in poverty, but they live in concentrated poverty. And that our high schools now are browner than they were just five years ago. So this data should not be a surprise to us. No. Yeah. And the second question is, in your view, um, I know on page 10 and then in a later um, slide, it, to me, I mean, obviously the, the tutoring, I think or in your view, is that one of the best tools we have? I know there was the learning hubs, the, but in your view, professional opinion. Yeah, it's what the national research says. Yeah. I mean, the whole country is trying to figure out how to scale tutoring and is using what we did as a model. Um, I think particularly with partnering with the graduate assistants mm -hmm. and making sure that we're training up. Um, we're hiring hundreds and hundreds of tutors, but we're not going to be done until every student that needs a tutor has a tutor. And it's not going to turn around like this. It's, um, you know, it's going to be, it's, it, it holds great promise, but it's going to be a while before we have the results yeah. to show that it's working. Yeah, because in my view, I think just looking at the industrialized world and how far fewer instructional days we have and hours compared to the rest of the world. Yeah. I think the young lady that spoke 
the last speaker, I mean, she nailed it. You know, they're not just competing with the peers, but it's China and Europe and everywhere else in this global economy. And I, I just hope as a board we do look at year-long school. I hope that's, that's you know, not a third rail that we're, um, you know, reluctant to enter into because I, I don't know. I mean, I just envision a system, you know, where you have the high – effective tutoring compared with a year-long school let's say boy you know it'd be interesting to see what the data would look like you know in three four five years but thank you for all the information thank you other questions Come. I have Linda um, what about TAs I mean you know we only got them in kindergarten I think or do we have them in first grade they're allotted based on kindergarten numbers, and then it depends on the staffing and the master schedule of the elementary right. school. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, get another pair of hands in there on a regular basis, freeze up the teacher to do to work one-on-one -on -one with. And so I know that what numbers I saw for first, second, and third grade across the board were not good as far as reading nationally, I guess. Maybe not Guilford, our numbers look better than what I was anticipating. Um, but, you know, I just think we need to start try to bring back some TAs um, into that first and second uh, grade levels that we used to have so that the teachers can have those small groups and they can focus on those that need that. That's just, you know, suggestion. And also, you know, this COVID, you know, administration stuff is still weighing down a lot of our, um, you know, staffing and the amount of stress level that that puts on them. And because it is a major effort to do that. So there again, anything we can offload. Um, I think our teachers are stressed. Our, our, we had a little EC teacher up here that's like, I'm barely hanging on. So anything we can do to try, I know that we need to be creative in how we provide more direct support to um, some of our staffing. That would be my take, because like you said, a hands-on is what's going to get you there the fastest. And, you know, I know that we want to get people that can actually know how to teach reading, because there is a difference between knowing how to teach reading and practicing reading, all right? Because I know I went through with that with my son. I could practice I didn't know how to teach. So it's, there is a big difference and practice helps, but if they're missing some kind of, uh, what do you call them? You have the words. It's the early foundational skills. Exactly. I don't know how to teach that and, and I can't identify where they're lacking. Whereas a skilled um, teacher in that knows whether they're missing this, this, and this, and this is what we gotta focus on. So I'll fix this and then they'll go. So, uh, but still practice and getting them to read is still helpful, so. Other questions and, oops, excuse me. Other questions, comments from Anita? Okay, what do we know about any end of course testing results? Do we have, what do we have? We, what we have, um, we have overall proficiency. We have it by um, racial ethnic group for biology. I mean, are you asking about the English 2, Math 1, Math 3, and Biology? Mm -hmm. We know overall proficiency, participation, um, and racial ethnic group, and students with disabilities and English learner performance. Okay, so um what do we know about the relationship between those scores and the graduation rate? So this, this two different, not, not necessarily the same group of students. So the students who are taking math one are typically, though in this report are ninth, were ninth grade students and the graduation rate was the seniors. Okay, what do we know about seniors end of course testing and the graduation rate is what kind of correlation is there i mean we if haven't any. done a correlation study by individual like if they graduated how did they perform if they didn't graduate how would they if they graduated how did they perform 
uh, did they graduate with skills? Or did they graduate because they came to school? You follow me? So they met the graduation requirements. They took That's the course. I get that. What do we know? What do we know about whether or not they passed courses and the graduation rate? I mean, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not making my point very well, but what I'm trying to figure out is the kids, we had a high, the highest graduation rate we've ever had. What do we know about what those students knew when they graduated? What was their knowledge? What was their skill set? What do we know about that? I'm not sure I understand. I mean, we, we know if they passed or didn't pass the end of course test. That's we know what if I'm they asking. took the credits required to graduate. Um, you know, that's why so many students, we had 11,000 students participate in summer learning many more middle and high school students than we've ever had before. Um, I think to improve to that path, to show mastery, to improve to the passing grade. But have we done a full correlation story uh, study um, no, we've just reported the data that we have. I think the difference is that the pandemic provided an opportunity for us to do something we haven't done before, and that was to give students additional opportunities. When we tend to say, uh, you didn't pass in four quarters, you fail. We said, you don't fail, you have a fifth quarter. We set up learning hubs in the evenings and on Saturdays and Sundays when students who worked suddenly had the opportunity to come to school in the evenings, to come to school on Saturdays and Sundays, and they had the, the chance to, uh, a second chance to do their work, to complete the work. Things we should have done for the last 10, 20 years yeah. give students additional opportunities to pass. And so that's why you see a higher graduation rate that we're treating kids like kids and giving them additional opportunities instead of just failing them in June. That didn't happen before. The state also moved the date, I think, from June to August for that's right, August 6th. And they're doing that again. And that gave uh, students an additional chance to be in their cohort. Uh, so, but I think the learning hubs, which uh, GCS was featured in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, on NPR, um, all over the country for the work we did to have these learning hubs all over at every comprehensive high school, and the principals dug in, and they went after these kids, and they made sure they held school seven days a week, something we'd never done before. And that's why the graduation rates are higher. And can I have a follow-up question on that? We used to have Twilight School. Uh, do we still have it? The, the Learning Hub serves as the home of the Twilight. So the principals like it much better because they said, we know the kids, they we can know, get them yeah. to come. We know who needs to come. We know what their schedule needs to be. And they're not busing, you know, at four o'clock to somewhere where they don't know the principal and the counselor. So this is, this is right now the model that we have. So we still have that at each of our comprehensive high schools. So, yeah, they launched this week. Okay. Um, so what I was looking for was the relationship between the ACT data on page 46 and the graduation rate on page nine, but there's really no correlation, you'll say. That's right. It's a norm reference test. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do we have any value, last question. Do we have any value added data on our students? Were we able to get any of that data? They're not gonna release it. No, they're not gonna provide that data. Um, DPI is not gonna provide that data, largely because the students did not test um, in 1920, and so, they, so there's a gap and the, the scores that we've received, so they can't measure the growth. So they're not going to try to norm that for and take into account the missing year? No. Okay, thank you. Can I just clarify, based on Anita's question, um, passing EOCs is a graduation requirement in, in required courses, correct? 
Can you graduate and not pass it in the course? So how does that work? So you can pass a course and not pass the test. The test counts as a percentage of your grade. Okay. So lots of those students who, um, you know, and we also, and where we were able, offered retests, um, you know, where the state allowed yeah. it. But that's why that um, fifth quarter was so important because they had to master the content that they hadn't mastered in order to pass the course, which is required for graduation. But you can fail an EOC and still graduate. If the rest of the requirements of the course have been met to balance that out. And is there an ACT requirement for graduation? No. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Okie doke. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions and conversation about academic outcomes and the ESSER funds and how that we continue to work to accelerate learning for our students. Um, but thank you all for your hard work to all of our principals and educators who are uh, really making extraordinary things happen under incredibly um, difficult circumstances. So thank you. Uh, we have one more committee report from the policy committee. Betty, do you have that for us this evening? She's going to find, she's like, oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> Everybody can be thinking about their closing remarks. There you go. Thank you. Betty is the chair of the policy committee. Thank you, board member Jenkins. Thank you so much. Thought I had lost it. Um, the policy committee, um, at the policy committee meeting held in September, the committee voted to send four revised policies out for a 30-day public comment period. Those policies are policy 1320, 3560, which is a Title I parent and family engagement, policy 4040, slash 7310, staff student relations, policy 4125, homeless students, and policy 7410, teacher's contract. As a reminder, these policies will come back to the board for discussion on December the 14th meeting after the public has had a chance to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, Diane? I'm sorry, Diane. If we have, if we have uh, questions or comments that we, we want to make to it, we have to we do it directly to you, or do we? You, you can you, speak to the policy chair. You can put them online, but we'll discuss the policies when we vote as well when they come back to the day. So there's all of those opportunities for you to weigh in. Other, anything else? All right, we're going to move to closing comments. I think I'll just start on the left. Anita? I knew you were going to do I'm that. I'm sorry, you want me to start on the right? I, I don't can, care. Okay. <laughs> it make any difference to me. Um, I just want to say that what I have seen in the schools that I have been visiting is orderliness, um, even during class changes, quietness in the school, cleanliness. I, I, I just, the schools are clean. Even if they're old, they're still clean. And I just want to take a minute to thank the staffs. I'm not going to name all the schools because I'll leave somebody out, but the staffs at all of these schools for the hard work they're doing and the dedication and the teachers for the learning that I have observed going on in these schools. Deborah. Okay, so one more with the visual aid real quick here. Um, I also am probably going to make a little short clip of this and put on my Facebook page if anybody wants to watch it again. On tonight's meeting, we had lottery funds come up, and the million-dollar question, literally, has been, what does Guilford County Schools do with the lottery money? Because if you go to the lottery website, everybody sees all the big numbers about the lottery money given to the school systems. So here we go. Say we get $100 from our county commissioners. We get 200, let's, let's, for the sake of the argument, let's say three for the state of North Carolina. And then the lottery looks at us and says, all right, great, you're a large district, so we're going to give you an extra couple hundred to go with it so you can get some extra stuff, right? The problem with our lottery bill is that there is a writer in it that says the state of North Carolina can, back, can come back to us and say, since you have this extra, 
we're going to take some and put back in our general budget because all you were supposed to have was this. And they do. They take that money back. Okay? So when you see those beautiful numbers on the lottery website, understand that the state of North Carolina can make those numbers nothing but a wash for us. Okay? All right. Next up. I hadn't planned on talking about this tonight, but here we are. <clears throat> it's very disheartening for me um, to hear people talk about COVID and about the death rate and how it is only. It's only this much. COVID is 99% survivable. It is 99.99% survivable. It's only this. The problem with any of those numbers, when you look at them in that direction, is you're ignoring the fact that there are millions of children in the United States. There are millions of adults. And that point zero zero whatever one percent that dies from this illness is still hundreds and hundreds. For the adults, it's been hundreds of thousands because we are such a populous nation. So far in the United States, we've lost more than 550 children under the age of 18 to COVID, most likely from the Delta variant. I, I don't have that exact number. Florida and Texas lead those death counts. I flat refuse to play my part in North Carolina losing any children to COVID. And I am so, so glad that none of you are inside my head to hear what it sounds like when a mother screams at the top of her lungs, begging you not to let her child die. If something on their face saves even one of them, I will always, always do it. Are they fun? No. Do a lot of the kids hate them? Yeah. Do a lot of adults hate them? Yes. Are they a fashion statement? No. And my teenager will be the first to tell you. But once again, it comes down to, especially in medicine, the argument of acceptable risk. Are there side effects from the masks? Sure. Are there side effects from the vaccine? Sure. Do they kill you? No. Please, 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 especially when you listen to your teachers ask you for this. Please support our mask mandate. And please support rational and civil discourse when it comes to these things. Nobody's out to hurt children here. Thank you. Good evening, thank you. Um, thank you for Dudley High School, Go Panthers, for the invitation to the Title I Parent Night. We had an awesome time with the parents and the students. October, as you're aware, um, is Breast Cancer Awareness, and I wear my pink um, in honor of them. Domestic Violence Awareness, and the National Principals Awareness um, Month. And to the principals in District 7, I will be seeing you this week, I'm sorry, next week, with a token of love. Thank you. Please mark your calendar for Tuesday, October 26th at 6 o'clock. There will be a virtual Hampton Peeler Neighborhood School Bond Meeting. The link is listed on the GCS website. My condolences go out to the families of Basil Wilson, a ninth grader at Dudley High School, Cameron Omar Robinson, first grader at Sedalia Elementary School, Brandon Redford, 10th grade student at Page High School, and to the chair, Dina Hayes Green, for her family loss. Thank you very much. Kim Irby, do you have comments this evening? Did she go? Yes. Yes, she's here. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead with your closing comments, please. Oh, thank you so much. Um, um, in the words of uh, Dr. James Comer, whatever it takes. So whatever it takes for us as a board, whatever it takes is where I'm at. If it takes a bond referendum, it's whatever it takes. Let's let's get it done for the families and children of Guilford County. If it means using the lottery money to pay down the debt, it's whatever it takes. The county chair told us last year to come back. So we're coming back. We're coming back with a bold request. And hopefully that request will be made. 
But then that request is going to go out to the voters. And then we'll really see what our, we are really made of, what we really want to happen. We saw many people come out tonight, you know, our principals and educators come out tonight in support of the work, in support of a proposal that we've been, that has been developed over the past four years hopefully will come to fruition that there will be something done for every school in Guilford County. So I'm just grateful tonight um, for the board that voted um, to make the request known, whatever it takes. And that's what we should be about. That's the kind of board we are. It's whatever it takes. If it takes wearing a mask to school so that we can keep our doors open, it's whatever it takes. If it takes giving kids a packet so that they can graduate, it's whatever it takes. If it takes staff members going to knock on doors, encouraging kids to come to school, thank you, staff members, for doing that work. Thank you. It's whatever it takes. Have a good night. Thank you, Dina. I'm going to come back to you last. Um, Linda? Um, first, I want to say I enjoyed the North Carolina School Board Association Fall Law Conference in Asheville. One of the most informative speakers was Jill's associate, Elizabeth Troutman, who spoke on Title IX. I would say it would do the board good to also hear that presentation. I also want to say I know GCS has strong administrators, teachers, and support staff that are focused on educating children and truly want to get out of the politics to get out of the politics to get out of their way so they can do the hard work of educating every child in their highest, at their highest potential. However, there, this past week I was startled. Um, there are some very political educational groups that believe parents can be dismissed and intimidated. I was appalled that the National School Board Association wrote a letter to President Biden about parents who are upset about what's going on in our schools. Please note there were 18 state school board associations that have indicated they did not support that letter. North Carolina was one of the 18. The letter indicated that parents' actions could be equivalent to a form of domestic terrorism and hate crimes. Wow. In response, the U.S. Attorney General threatened to mobilize the entire police power of the state against parents. At a time where we have many cities destroyed with rioting and looting that resulted in 25 deaths, and the U.S. attorney deems parents domestic terrorists. Now, what comes out of this is the U.S. attorney's son-in-law is the founder and president of Panorama, a multi-million dollar company that sells CRT and related ESG materials to schools, GCS included. Now, I have questions as a board member. What services and materials is GCS utilizing? Is Panorama the data warehouse being utilized by GCS? Are they designated as a school official? Which is, a, um, is Panorama um, the company, is, is the company that the data that GCS captured, is it available to other for, uh, entities for marketing? So I would like to see the contract and know exactly what services they're providing. We are in a different time. How did parents become the enemy of the state? Your children are not the property of the education system. You are the parent and you have rights. It is your job to advocate and protect your child and to, and to not let anyone stop you. You now know if you know if CRT, if CRT is a wonderful situation, there should be no need to use such outrageous overreach of weaponizing the DOJ against parents. School systems should throw their doors open and let parents see everything. Where is the transparency? Parents are now the enemy of the U.S. government the National School Board Association, the Federation of the Teachers, the National Association, the North Carolina Association of Educators, all because they're utilizing their freedom of speech to advocate and protect their children. And I think politics are 
out of control. Pat? Well, um, maybe I can play Monopoly with Deborah, but I don't have the, the all the dollars and stuff. Um, yeah. And, uh, and to be more serious note, and, and I'm a Quaker, and, and, and um, we often say, friend speaks my mind. So I w I'm not copying your notes, Linda, but I do have some things that, it, that have been weighing on me uh, in, in recent weeks. Um, and, and so I want to start with applauding all parents that take their time to come here and patiently stay, wait in line and sign up um, to speak for three minutes or less. To even if they don't make it in and, and can speak, they hold signs. And 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 for the fairly short amount of time I've been here, almost five years, you know, I've had my name called out. You know, I've been from right there, and that's okay. I mean, we sign up for that. Um, and I'm not talking about criminal conduct or harassment. Um, but I will say that having a justice department and an attorney general at the behest of the president to unleash the vast power of the FBI and their almost unlimited resources on the backs of moms and dads um, as domestic terrorists uh, is unprecedented. And that's dangerous um, to take aim at hardworking and dedicated parents that only want the best for their child's education. Um, so to me, it's, it can only be described as uh, intent to silence political opponents in school districts across the country. We have local law enforcement. If there's some sort of harassment, uh, criminal activity, um, I mean, we can't even find Brian Landry, for heaven's sake, but we're going to get the FBI involved in, in parents and their child's education. That, that's sad. I mean, I don't know if anyone here was around for the McCarthy era or at home, but it seems this administration intent on bringing it to us with renewed energy and vigor. So I just hope that we'll um, be cognizant of that. Um, you know, the sum and substance of the First Amendment um, is expressly written for what's happening out there and inside uh, during our public comments. And um, I just hope that we'll honor that. And, and, and I know that we will. And, and you know, I think uh, earlier we said that unlike some of our other um, elected officials and those bodies, we are having these open meetings. And, and that's to be that's to be applauded. <laughs> so um, I think it's just sad that we have the FBI <laughs> Um, with their vast resources, unlimited, um, taking aim at parents. That's, that's a sad, dangerous day. Thank you. Diane. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, the, the first thing I, I just want to um, ask for Dr. Contreras and staff to take a look at is um, our food services. Um, I realize that because we have to do packaging food now, you know, to get to the kids as opposed to the cafeteria service, that we got some challenges. But uh, um, I keep getting, you know, some reports that the quality of the food is not necessarily the best for, or or maybe it's just that our kids are used to McDonald's, and this ain't McDonald's. So I think we're going to have to revisit you know, what we're doing. And I, and I realize there probably is a limited number of vendors out there. But, you know, parents expect that, I guess, if their children are getting food at school, it should be something that is at least presentable and, and uh, advertising to their kids. So I wanted to bring that up. Uh, I want to thank all of the staff, and I think we need to do this at every meeting from, from until we're out of whatever this craziness called a pandemic is. But, um, you know, we need to thank all of you guys for, first of all, risking yourselves. Secondly, you know, risking your own families. And then the hard work that you're putting in, despite all of this, because you do make progress, and you have. The graduation rate speaks to that. Uh, you know, whenever I see, you know, that the, you have very can-do attitudes of your administrative, your, your, your principals, 
And even when the teachers are complaining and they're not necessarily happy, they still show up and get the job done. So I think we need to continue to make sure we say thank you to all of our staff for what they do. And then I want to give a special thanks to uh, Lisa Nolan. She's awesome. She has done a tremendous job in the time that I've uh, had the opportunity to work with her. And I just want to publicly say thank you so much for everything you've done. You go, girl. <laughs> um, and then um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, on Friday, I had the opportunity uh, that my alma mater uh, bestowed upon me the Harvey E. Beach Distinguished Alumni Award. And the work that I've done since I've been on the school board, the work that I've done for the past 40 years <laughs> was part of the reason why. And if you understand the significance, because the group that did this is called BAR, the Black Alumni Reunion. And to sit there and basically have the history of why we were there. Um, the, the man that this award that I got was named for was one of the five uh, students who uh, sued Carolina to uh, have the right for black students to be at their law school. And J. Kenneth Lee, who resided here was one of those students. So it, at least it wasn't lost on me why we even have a bar or why I went to Chapel Hill 50 years ago when women had only been started being in undergraduate school except at black, white, or indifference just two years before I got there. So in one way we say we've come a long way, but we still have work to do. And that's why our work, equity work here is so good. One of the things I can tell you about this group is that they gave 20 scholarships to students um, in their 20 and 21 classes. Um, so so this, this group invests in the education. And UN, UNC is considered a public institution. So, you know, at a higher level, but it's considered a public institution. So I'm very honored that somebody decided that I'm not just a pain in the, that I do do things that get good things happening for my communities and have been doing it for a very long time. So thank you for being a part of that. And then finally, I just want everybody to be safe as we participate in the fall activities, whether it's a hayride, whether it's going to get a pumpkin, whether it's going out for Halloween, we still got to realize that the virus is still out there. And so we can't be uh, uh, careless because we want to have fun. We still have to be, you know, on our guard about where we go, when we go, and how we go. So I hope everybody will, you know, remember that. Because if you take your kids out to a Halloween thing and they come to school on Monday, if they've been exposed, then they wind up exposing everybody in their classroom. So we got to pay attention you know, the only reason I'm sitting here tonight is because the infection rate went down to 5%. And I felt comfortable enough to be here in person. Because I'm scared. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I'm scared. So, because I, I don't want to die, at least not yet. So, whatever we can do to protect each other and take care of each other, I, I think we need to, as, as Ms. Napper said, none of us ever want to be in a position of, not, not, it doesn't have to be your child. Just having a loved one that they got to tell you it's time. We don't want that, particularly when it doesn't have to happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to speak and then call on Dina. Um, I'm not going to let the sleeping dog lie in that I do believe there's a well-funded, well-orchestrated political machine that's using language and issues to create um, more vitriolic, reactions to what's happening in schools. They have a right to do it. For the most part, it seems to be legal. When it crosses the line, I do think it should be addressed. And I don't think this language of parent can be owned by a particular group, that somehow parents are being persecuted. I'm a parent. Joe Biden's a parent. The attorney general's a parent. I think it's a word like believer or like patriot that certain groups want to own and then begin to define. So um, 
I don't have a strong opinion about the letter that went to the attorney general or the federal government's response, but I'll say parents have done all kinds of things. There are many different kinds of parents, just like there are people. Parents killed Emmett Till. Parents stormed the U.S. Capitol. Parents did violent things to stop schools from being integrated. Parents love their children. Parents abuse their children. Parents do lots of things. So we should be careful about using that word to describe some particular class of people who are being persecuted. So people in this country have a right to advocate, to protest, and to do that vigorously. And I also hope that we will encourage them to do it respectfully. We'll be respectful to one another. And so I don't think parents are being persecuted as a class, not by schools, not by the federal government, certainly not by this Board of Education. We welcome and have many ways to show that parents are um, involved in education, that their views are considered and appreciated, and I think this district does an excellent job of that. So um, I felt compelled to speak to that issue, and Dina, you get the closing remarks tonight. And um, before Mrs. Hayes speaks, I just wanted to, I know um, Mrs. Bellamy Smalls always asked uh, when you raise an issue, um, you raise the school nutrition problem. Uh, you do that so that I can make certain that it comes up at, at another meeting. And I am more than happy to look into the issue. I did send to the board, and I want the public to know that if you just do a quick Google search, you can see these are the headlines in the last five days. Metro Atlanta schools adjust lunch amid food supply staffing problems. Metro Detroit school districts struggle to feed students amid global supply chain shortage. The Washington Post, school nutrition programs face new crisis as supply chain issues increase. The next one, school meals are being impacted by supply chain issues. Timeline for relief is unclear. Clarksville now, that's not nourishment. School lunches scale back over supply chain issues. NBC News, supply chain issues, labor shortages make serving school lunch a struggle. The Buffalo News, no chicken tenders for lunch. School cafeteria squeezed by supply chain delays. It goes on and on. I can look into this, but I cannot fix everything. And I know you know that but I want the public to understand the supply chain delays are impacting every issue in schools, every element of schooling, every element of public life. And so I wish I could say that this is something that my school nutrition department could fix, that I can fix, that every school district is facing this, and I just hope that things will improve soon. Thank you for raising that, Mrs. Bellamy Small. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, Winston, and thank you for your comments. Um, you really captured so much of what I wanted to say. I am concerned that adult behavior across the country is eliciting a kind of uh, threat and radicalizing of certain groups of people that are a threat and are a danger. I received a letter today requesting uh, me to step down from my organization as I pose a terrorist threat to American citizens and communities, asking me to turn my credentials over to President Donald Trump and to be advised that American patriots are watching me and that they have many boots on the ground and for me to be smart and wise. Signed, sincerely, the American patriots, the United States Constitution, and the Republic freedom and liberty for all. This was mailed to my home today. So I don't take that lightly, and I will be turning that over to the authorities uh, because someone had uh, the comfort of putting their name and address on that as they sent that to me. Um, I've been on this board. As a matter of fact, my first board meeting was a redistricting meeting in High Point in 2002. And, um, you know, there were a lot of um, spirited, um, <coughs> concerned citizens there. And we've seen that, um, you know, whether it's around a cafeteria or it's around a uh, policy. We have seen that over the years, but there is something that is going on that is terribly concerning right now. Um, and, um, and Winston, I think you just spoke very clearly to that. 
I would also like to um, just thank everyone. Um, many of you know that my mother-in-law and my father, who my husband and I were taking care of, died within a day and a half of each other, um, sort of unexpectedly while we were both very sick. And um, the Guilford County Schools community uh, principals and schools and the district office and other staff and the superintendent and board members uh, and so many others uh, called and wrote and texted and emailed and brought food and supplies and flowers. And I just want to say, say thank you so much to all of those of you that, um, that reached out. It, was, um, it has been a very, very difficult time, but um, I uh, felt very cared for and uh, appreciate that so much. So I look forward to joining you uh, on November 6th at our retreat. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Diane, somebody got a second. second. All those in favor, rise. Bye. Thank you.